So welcome, I am on this Google Hangouts here with Stops. Um, this is Rob from Speakers Corner UK. And this is just a general chat about, between the two of us, we've met on YouTube, I've seen a lot of Stops' videos. I've been very impressed, I've been very educated and amused by it. Uh, and I joined the Gin and Tonic show last Sunday. And so we decided to have this hangout between the two of us just to share a bit of information to get to know each other. And obviously we're both interested in religion and Islam and so forth. And so. I was originally brought up in South Africa, as you can hear in the accent. I now live in the UK for the last many number of years uh, in London. And so I visit Speakers Corner UK regularly, at least a couple of times every month. And I'm non-religious, I'm an atheist, and I go there to understand what people believe and why they believe it. And I've started to record videos. Initially, a few people started to record videos of me. And so I started about February this year. And so I'll be going for give or take eight months. So it's been an interest of me, of mine, as to, you know, as I say, what people believe and why they believe it. And when I go down there, the majority of interactions are with Muslims. So as I've had that, I've sort of learned more about what they believe, why they believe it. I've had a look into some of the reasons. I'm still a long way from, you know, having a very good grasp of everything they believe, specifically about the Quran and the Hadiths and the Surah, etc. Uh, and so I'm still at the point where I'm at the bigger picture, do the bigger beliefs make sense the belief in a god the specifically allah etc and so i go down there to find that out to have conversations with these guys uh, and sometimes ladies uh, as well as a few christians and obviously i've met a few atheists there and I, i'm still learning a lot i'm going down there with a critical mind um, and i've now started to develop a bit of an interesting philosophy really because of some of the interactions there and i want to be as rational and logical as possible and i want flaws and fallacies that i make or errors in thinking to be pointed out so that I can improve, you know, from that point of view. I essentially want to believe as many true things as possible as I can. And so, as we mentioned during the beginning part of, of this, um, I've sort of followed the atheist experience and various other things, and I've been looking into a lot of different conversations online. And so that's where I'm coming from. And so um, it'd be great to hear your views because I've, I've seen a lot of your videos and you seem to have a great knowledge on the Quran and Hadiths, etc. And that's kind of where I will learn a lot from you and, and a lot of your videos. So over to you, Stops. Yeah, sure. But now, do, do you understand? Okay. Did you ever subscribe to any, any kind of, of God or, or this, this, this supernatural being? Yeah, actually, when I was younger, I, I was never really into to religion at all. And then at one point, my parents got into... Um, Christianity and I became saved. I remember going to the front of the stage when I was about 14 or something like that uh, and accepting Jesus Christ as my savior. And I remember specifically three of us in front of 500 people standing in front, beholding this uh, pastor's hand and I'm accepting Jesus, my personal Lord and savior. And I look back and I, obviously I wasn't critically thinking at the stage. And the reason I did it was because I was so fearful of them going to heaven and me not. And so the whole reason I didn't wasn't because I really believed it, it was because I thought, well, you know, if the rest of my family have accepted Jesus and they're going to go to heaven when they die, I don't want to be the only one not going to heaven. So I ended up doing that. Um, so, so it was cool. a fear-based reason. Uh, and then I kind of, we did it for a couple of years and then I kind of just left it. And I, and I would definitely have considered myself agnostic atheist. And it's only when I came to this country that I started to look into it. Uh, and I went, mean, okay, this is different. Started looking at things on YouTube, picked up Christopher Hitchens. And from there, of course, it went to all the big atheists and, and it's sort of just, you know, momentum has gone on from there. Okay. So was it in here cars? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it was actually an English version. So it's more like, um, it's called Rayma. So it's very yaya. -ya. They all sort of jump out of their seats and they sing and they oh, get so happy slain. Clappies. You got it. Yeah. Slain <laughs> in the spirit. So people are collapsing are all around me. They're speaking in tongues. So I'd have these people collapsing and I'm going, why is God not touching me? Everybody else is falling over here. What's wrong with me? You know, so I had that going on and people are talking gobbledygook and I'm going, well, why isn't this happening for me? Am I the only Sadia who's like, you know, God is not involved with? So it was kind of really confusing as well. Like, what's wrong with me? You know, so. I can speak in tongues like Pratital. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, you know, but this was like, <laughs> like what? Did, did you still know these, these Peter Dirk Ace and all those people? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Oh, that was brilliant. <laughs> totally theatral, totally bisexual, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, with, with me, the story is actually in the beginning is quite similar. 
<clears throat> because I was also dragged off to church. Um, like, like it's it's Christmas and Easter, and let's go to church. Um, the thing the thing it stopped after a while because I used to giggle. <laughs> the, the priest used to have this thing where at, at the end he used to stand in the middle and he used to hold his hands out like satellite dishes, and then he would say, "May the Lord bless you and blah 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 and all this all the same." And I used to sit there and I used to. Um, you know, inspired by Superman and, and Batman and all these Marvel comics where rays used to come out of the hands of the people. And the way that he was standing there, I used to imagine this blessing because I, I still don't understand what a bless is. Um, that, that I used to imagine these, these blesses coming out of his hands and I used to sit there and giggle. And that did not make me very popular because you're supposed to be like all in awe and that. And I used to think this is hilarious. Um, so then church attendance was was minimized. And then what actually happened, this is quite, okay, we've got time for a quick story. Um, this is more of an anecdote because um, I, I was in school and I had this huge crush on a girl and she came to school wearing like like completely in white. And she had this, this really beautiful complexion, this dark billowing hair and, and all in white. And she was a sight to behold. And I was like, Wow, you look great. And then Nina, her, her friend, was standing next to her and she said, Listen, you're such an asshole. She's in mourning. I said, What do you mean? No, her uncle died. I said, Well, how am I supposed to know that? But you can see she's dressed in white. I said, Well, it looks good on her. And she says, Yeah, but she's Zoroastrian. And they apparently mourn in white. I didn't know that. So I felt a total off. And then um, I asked others, okay, what is this Zoroaster and blah, 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 and I got some information. Now, this was in Tehran, and everybody else was Muslim or Christian or something. Now, I grew up as a Christian in a Muslim country, and now there were Jews in the class. Now, I remember, I, I sort of understood what they are, but now I heard another God got involved here. And then people say, well, it's like, like in Hinduism, you have this, but the opposite is Zoroaster, where this is one of the oldest ones with only one God. And I thought, oh, God, what the hell is going on here? I went home, and I thought to myself, yeah, but hang on. I've got Jews, I've got Christians, I've got Muslims, I've got Hindus, now I've got this other God. What is going on here? How can you have so many gods if they can't decide who is the boss here? If, they, if this is a whole, I don't know, like a department or a group or something, this, 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 this can't be. So I, at the tender age of what, 12, realized they can't all be right, they must, but they can be wrong. And then I started getting daring, and I, I used to, and this I remember very distinctly, I'm sitting on the edge of my bed, thinking evil thoughts. What if this God is not all powerful? And then I used to wait for the lightning bolt, nothing happened. Then, you know, you get more daring over time. But then after a while, after like three or six months, I actually managed to think, think that is, at least because I was also shit scared of, of going to hell and, and things like that. What if there is no God? Because no matter how much I prayed for less pimples and better grades, and you know, nothing happened. So then eventually I thought this evil thought and nothing happened. And that's when I realized, shit, I'm free. There's no, there's no gods. And then I stopped thinking about gods. I was free and I never thought back. And then over the years, I was never confronted by gods. There was just nobody who wanted to talk about gods in my environment with friends, family, nobody. And then, um, I, at, I don't know, this is like almost 10 years ago, I came to Abu Dhabi for a job interview because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a freelancer, I do processes, I do all sorts of things. And, I was at a job interview and the guy asked me, well, what do you think about the origin of the universe? And I thought, what? what is going on? This is a job interview. And then he said, well, this is um, a question that interests me because you have all the qualifications, so I want to know what you think about that. So, so I said, well, you know, nature, we don't know, and maybe this. And so I, I started, you know, mumbling something, trying not to, um, you know, offend anybody. And then in the end, he said, you're an atheist. I said, oh, really? And I thought, why should I be an atheist? I don't believe in gods. Why, why, why is he trying to insult me now? Because I thought atheists are terrible people. And then they took me anyway. Then he came to me, and then after a meeting, he said, can, can you just stay behind? I said, yeah, and then we finished. Da, da, da. And then he said, okay, by the way, did you look into the Quran yet? I said, no, I haven't had time. And this was now, I was in, in Kabul now. 
and he said, well, why don't you go there? There's miracles in the Quran. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I started looking at Islam through the eyes of scientific miracles contained in the Quran. And I looked at that and I found this was total hokum, total bullshit, total rubbish. And I thought, how do I tell my boss? Now, luckily then the Taliban attacked the hotel and then they, they somehow, even though I, I was downstairs within, what, seven, eight meters, they missed me. And then they ran into the spa area and killed everybody there. So I was lucky. And then they collected us downstairs in the basement and blah, blah, blah. And that's when I started getting interested. So I started looking at Islam. And because Islam very much is dependent on the Bible, on, on Judaism, I started looking at the Bible. And then I started Judaism, Christianity, and then went back to, um, to, to Islam. So there you have it. And then um, because I was in the Middle East, because after that, then I went to Dubai, and then I went to Doha, then I went to Jeddah. Because there, okay, you can't do this in Riyadh. I mean, in, in Jeddah is even, even more relaxed than, than, than Riyadh, because Riyadh is, is very tight. In Doha, I used to go to the culture center there, Dufana, and I was called the crazy atheist. And every time I walked in there, like I used to walk in there on a Friday or a Saturday or something, they used to bring out the tea, they used to bring the guys, and then we used to discuss Islam because I always had questions that they thought were interesting, where the guys couldn't understand how an atheist could go into that, that fana, into this um, Muslim Islamic center, and ask questions about Islam without being a Muslim. That's why they called me the crazy atheist there. So, but, but uh, this, was, this was very friendly. So this is my story about, about Islam. Wow, that's awesome and, and pretty scary with that sort of attack on the hotel. Um, yeah, it was, that was quite bad actually because, I mean, you, you see the guy who like 10 minutes before gave you your, your, the card for the room and the code for the internet. And then you hear the commotion downstairs because the whole hotel shook because of the suicide bomber. You run downstairs and all that's left of the guy is a two by two puddle of blood. That's it. Holy smoke. So that was, that was, and then of course, when you walk outside, you literally walk across human parts. So even though it was a huge explosion, there are still bits and pieces of a human left. And that was, that was nasty. Yeah, that's horrific. You know, people see it on the news or they don't because they blur it out. And I think when you're in the Western you know, world, you kind of get desensitized, you hear it in the news, yeah, and it's exactly. just, it's like, um, you know, a, an animal got killed or something with these explosions, and it's horrific, wherever it is, be it Syria, be it anywhere in the Middle East, or anywhere else in the world, but again, for me, you know, being here in London, I'll be honest, uh, you get desensitized, you go, oh, another bomb goes off, you know, I mean, you couldn't imagine what it must be like there. I mean, I was in the police, I was in the um, security services, not security service, in the um, defense force in, in South Africa, and fortunately, I was never involved in a live fire or anything like that okay. um, but you know so it's hard to imagine but I can see how it would be you know when people just yeah it's just another news story you just kind of flick onto it and there's you know tens or hundreds of people being killed and it's like a daily weekly basis and a lot of it you know it seems to be because the news only shows that part of but a lot of it seems to be you know Muslim on Muslim or you know some kind of um, Muslim bar Violence. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm not condoning, or and I don't know a lot about you know the drone strikes and all that sort of stuff. Because obviously, the response that I get, you know, in, in Speaker's Corner, is oh well, look at you know America and the UK, and and they're all you know bombing and they're all fighting and and they're exploiting you know all the Muslim lands. And um, I don't know whether that's the case. What I what I do notice is that Muslims are bombing Muslims, and that kind of you know that that sort of is a bit of a spanner in the works if you're going to say imperialism is is the one of the, the driving forces of you know Muslim violence. Yeah. Now you're going to do that because I mean, come on, the, all of the '80s was was the Iran Iraq war, and then mm. Iraq walked into Kuwait. So come on, what is that? That that was not due to a drone strike. This was not due to anything. This was Islam on Islam, Muslims on Muslims. Mm. That's so right. That's it. Okay, we, we can talk about the second Iraq war, and, and, and I'm tot I was totally against it, absolutely. But I, mean, I don't see this as a justification for anything. The same way as I don't see drone strikes as a, justif as a justified means now to go and, and you know, avenge some, some other task. I think there's a lot of stuff that should be left alone and, and people should be left to sort it out because you can't. 
I mean, no matter what action you take in Syria, for example, it's always going to end up wrong. You're always going to be left with a dirty end of the stick, and that's that's it. Yeah, we don't have all the information either. And you know, I'm certainly yeah. not one that goes. Western governments are all perfect, and it's just wonderful. There's a lot of conspiracies, a lot of things going on that we don't know about, and, and I'm certainly very open to that. I just need good ev good evidence and reasons to believe certain things. So I'm quite happy to 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 be shown that you know the UK government or the US government is not doing things in the best interest of their citizens. At the same time, you've got to demonstrate that. And I think for me, it's like, where would one rather live? And I'm still quite comfortable to live in a relatively free Western society than perhaps some other places on, on the planet. Yeah, yeah. And this is the thing. And I'm quite happy to point out all the good things in Islam. Okay, I'm, I'm not phobic about this. And, and this, this, this uh, incident has not made me bitter or angry or anything like that because there's one thing it helped me understand, and that is most Muslims are better than their God, but unfortunately not all of them. Now, what I'm trying to do is make those who are aware what Islam really is, to make them think about what it is that they believe and why they believe it, to enable them to take ownership of their own ideology, which is not happening at the moment. So that anybody who wants to use or abuse or whatever Islam, is unable to do so because everybody is going to be saying no it doesn't work like that this is not islam islam is x y and z which we don't have at the moment because at the moment because everybody is tiptoeing around i mean i've asked people muslims for about a year now a very straightforward question do you categorically condemn the stone or condemn those muslims who stone a woman to death now this is a yes no question and mm. everybody should answer, yes, I condemn those Muslims who stone a woman to death. You will not get it. They are too scared to go and, and criticize Muslims, their own in-group, their own creed, for the fear that they might be doing something wrong. They would rather go and say, this is Allah's punishment, and therefore I have to condone it, and I have to accept that it is a punishment by the God who knows what is best for us. And they will not condemn Muslims who stone a woman to death. And this is where the sad part comes in. Well, I'll do my best this weekend. Uh, I'm going to make do my best ever to get down to Speaker's Corner on Sunday. And, and that's again, I, you know, if I remember, I will ask that question of some of the, let's call it the more intelligent Muslims. When I, I'm not disparaging of other people that are there, but the guys that have been there quite a lot that you know, have looked into many of these things that feel that they have an answer to most questions or have, have had those questions asked. Because, you know, when I, do, when I go down there, there's, there's maybe a handful, let's call it a dozen, maybe 10, 12 of them that are there regularly. And so they've probably, you know, had most of these questions. They've probably done some study in some sense. Uh, but you'll, you'll get a lot of people coming through who don't, who, have, who are nominal Muslims. And then, you know, they don't really have answers. And my whole point of going down there is not to catch people out and go, I've won an argument. And I think for me, that's, and again, everybody's entitled to their own views and then how they want to do it. Um, I want to go down there and find out what's true. And if somebody makes a mistake, I'm not going to call them out for making the mistake per se. I'm going to call out uh, what I see as, as a bad or an incorrect idea. And it's got nothing to do with the people. And I think because I've done some psychological training as well, I'm very keen to separate a person from their, you know, erroneous beliefs. So you are not idi an idiot because you believe X. This is an idiotic belief. And that's separate from a person. Now, and, and I fall for it as well. And, and, you know, I do notice that happens is, you know, if, if, a, if one person's got a lot of idiotic beliefs, it's very easy to call them an idiot and to some degree that, you know, that's probably justified. Uh, but I, I do my best to, to attempt to separate that. And, you know, the same thing with, you know, communicating with people is trying to get to the ideas and not the person. But the other thing I wanted to go back to is what you said about Islam, and I want to get your views on this. Here's what I consider almost like a knockdown argument against Islam in this sense. Are you aware of the, the you probably are aware of the religion called Jainism? Mm -hmm. And so one of the number one tenets of Jainism is the non-injury to all living beings. Sure. Now, that's not what I see explicitly in any, in any way in my so far limited you know, study of Islam, is that th th there's this overriding you know, tenant that there's non injury to all living beings because if a Jain did anything, because you know, the more extreme you are as a Jain, the more you are likely to avoid hurting, you know, bugs and, and you know, that sort of thing. So, if it, so if a Jain did any violence, you can immediately say, Hey, this Jain is not acting in the name of Jainism. 
I don't see that with Islam in any way. And so people have to then, you know, um, tap dance and reinterpret verses, etc., to make it appear that it's nonviolent. And of course, the people in the Middle East take them much more literally and fundamentally, which is just really following them more closely slash literally. Uh, and of course, violence is, can be easily condoned if you follow it or if you've got a certain perspective. So for me, that's a knockdown argument. It seems to be anyway against the ideology. If Islam had a clear mandate, no injury or, or you know, or anything like that against somebody, then we could say they're not acting in the name of Islam. But it, it's very easy to see that, you know, they can certainly take verses and use them in the name of Islam. You know, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. Well, the thing is, <clears throat> you, you need to understand, <sighs> how do I <laughs> get this as, as short and in a nutshell as possible so that I don't ramble? Islam has a couple of things which are being reinterpreted. So the definition for peace is not what we would call it, the, the absence of violence and death and killing and destruction, but it is the, the common submission to this one God. So even in, in Syria now, it's, it's perfect peace because it's, it, it, all the Muslims are praying to the same God. So the, this, this death and destruction is not part of peace. This is why a Muslim is not lying when they tell you Islam is all about peace. The second thing is, if Islam is... Okay, Islam is a political ideology, all right, at the end of the day. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a religion. This is secondary. The this, this spiritual aspect is secondary. Primarily, it's, it's the, the, the supremacy of the religion of Islam, the political ideology. That, mm. That's the complete thing. So the goal of Islam is to integrate or to, to uh, install Sharia so that everybody lives under the Sharia in whichever capacity or way or whatever. Now, if you do not go for the Sharia, then you, can, you have the so-called dhimmi status. In other words, you pay the Muslims and they will take you under their wings so that if somebody attacks them, they will protect you and defend themselves. This is where this idea comes from that Islam is all about defense. The problem is, again, this definition, what is war on Islam? What you and I are doing in the eyes of some of the Muslim muftis is a war on Islam because we are educating people on Islam. So if you look at the text, the way that they come down from the tablets to, to this via this God, via the angel, via this Muhammad, then via the people to the scribes into the book. There are so many error points and people have to rely on Muhammad as being the single source that this is the Islam, the way that it is intended by the God. Now you have all these, these contradictions and all these variations and, and all these horrible things with sex slaves and married sex slaves and all this shit. So they have to go and somehow now rationalize what the book says with reality today. Mm -hmm. And this is where this re-re-re-translation and re-re-re-interpretation takes place. But they can't get around the hadith. And this is where you get now um, the Quranists who are saying, let's do away with what Muhammad did, because he is the factor who is now brutalizing, vandalizing, raping, killing, throttling, plundering, torturing, and, 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 and enslaving people. Let's do away with that and stay with the Quran redo the Quran so that um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a sheep with wool and that's it. And it's all cuddly and soft and, and whitewashed. This is, this is how what is happening. It's interesting because obviously when I go down to Speaker's Corner, there's nobody like you. And I want to ask you in the next question in a moment, your sort of, sort of what degree you're in depth in the Quran. But before I do that, when I go down to Speaker's Corner, it's all about the Quran. All you have to do is read the Quran. And, and what you were saying about it being a political ideology is exactly what Bill Warner says. He's an American guy, and, and you yeah, probably yeah. know him. And I bought some of his books, and I'm looking into it. Oh, what do you think is running here? An abridged Quran, the reconstructed historical Quran. That's the one I'm reading because that one is <laughs> shortened. It's also put in a chronological order, and it, and he's exactly. taken out the repetitiveness of multiple you know, verses and surahs about Moses and so forth. And 
So he's done it from a very analytical point of view from what yeah. I can see. And he's also, you know, bookmarked. So he knows exactly how much percent is the Quran takes up like 30% of Islam, political Islam, the Hadith take up another percentage exactly. and the Surahs take up another. So I like that approach where he's really broken it down analytically so you can look at it. And so that makes more sense because every time I go to Speaker's Corner, all I'm you know, told is just read the Quran. And of course, I've started to read the Quran and, and you, you read it and, and it doesn't make very much sense. It's not in an easy to read style, even the translation, um, but it starts non-chronologically. So um, there's a bit of a spanner in the works there as well when people tell me how wonderful it is because that's not the way it was originally um, dictated to Muhammad anyway. So somebody's gone and changed that. It wasn't Muhammad's choice as far as I'm aware to go and put it, you know, biggest surah to, to smaller surah, a shorter surah in, in that particular order. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's what I'm getting. Nobody, almost nobody that I hear about ever talks about the hadith down there because they probably don't have another scholar, let's say yourself, Bill Warner, whoever it might be, that knows more, or um, the, and another guy that they hate, um, David Wolf, and, and whoever it is that's, that's got quite a bit of information on this. Of course, they're, you know, Islamophobes, et cetera, et cetera, which, you know, again, isn't useful. That's just bigotry, and it's just, you know, let's label somebody because we don't like their ideas instead of tackling the ideas. But it seems to me the more people understand and the more they, they tackle those things, like the hard things, which is really the Hadith. You know, the Quran is kind of like the top layer, it seems to be. Um, the, the more they don't like that. But but down there, I almost never hear anybody going into the Hadith, probably because people like me don't know about it. But I would be interested if somebody came down that was really learned from a, a non-Islamic uh, point of view and then had conversations around these so-called, um, what's the word, um, authentic hadiths, et cetera, and see how they deal with those sort of things. I mean, Jay Smith does it, and of course they hate him, and he's all wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I want to ask you then, to what level, you know, what sort of knowledge have you got? How long have you sort of studied the Quran, and, and where would you sort of put yourself in that, that sphere? <laughs> you, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Okay, the Quran I know inside out, okay? I'm not a Hafiz. Um, I know, like, maybe what 50 80 um numbers and I, I know the contents um I, although i can't always put a number to it um but i would be able to give you like 50 60 numbers at the moment you mean of the um, quran itself you'd be able to you, you'd have a reasonably good idea of, of if i said to you where the heavens and the earth were split asunder you'd have a reasonable idea maybe not quoting it actual surah but you'd have a good idea of what i was talking about and you could find that very quickly for example in the quran 56 49 i think it is <laughs> there you go. okay so okay so so these things like the the, the normal things that, mm. that i need i mean misogyny i mean those i, I know offhand of course and and then it's it's some of these these miracle things which i've done over time um with the hadiths i have a very good understanding how they work um, what the contents is, I do not know all 20,000, of course. I have not read all of them. Um, what, what I try and do is, is go deeper into that and bring some hilarious ones at, for the Hadith of the Week in the Gin and Tonic Show. And that is always an eye-opener for me because I go and try and read a couple and then I copy and put them into a collection which I then use on the Gin and Tonic Show. So this is always, um, always quite funny. And the, the thing is, you can hadith can be used for anything and the sunnah in general because the sunnah consists of the hadith the normally it's the six um plus then the the biography and sometimes and this is quite funny sometimes people will go to scholars and say the muawatta there's there's certain texts or or, or um, even Ghazali and, and people like that and they will use contents from those people to make a point but they know that if anybody knows this, the danger is that they will be taken for a ride because you can take any one of those and find exactly the opposite. So if somebody comes to me, well, we follow what Muhammad does. Now, remember, he's the single source. But mm. He also does things which is the action, the thoughts, the um, utterings, the mumblings, the whatever he did is now taken as this is the law. So, for example, Muhammad says, there's no alcohol. You are not allowed to drink alcohol. You're not allowed to touch alcohol. It's, it's, it's forbidden. It's everything. If you go to the Quran, it doesn't say that. So this is a video I'm doing at the moment to explain this to people. There is nothing about prohibited alcohol in the Quran, but it's in the Hadith. So people are following not the God, but Muhammad. And this is the point. The same thing with the number of prayers. 
they're not following the God, they're not following Muhammad, they're following Moses, according to the Hadith. So, if Muhammad says, okay, wash your hands twice, is that something you follow? Yes. But now the next one is, is you need to follow and wash them three times. So what do you do? Well, then they, they say, okay, you, you can either wash them twice or three times, however, what you want. Now, this is what I call the dualism in, in, in Islam. Everything is dual. If you go and you, you look at the Quran, you will find there's no compulsion in religion. Your religion to you, my religion to, my, to me. But on the other hand, you, you have the opposite. And, and 105 times it says, if you don't do that, you will be tortured for eternity. Now, how, how do you consolidate this? You can't. And yet Muslims manage it because they're saying both are valid, both are true, even their opposing views. And they will not accept it. They will simply say, well, at, at this, this time, at this stage, here in this situation, this is applicable, and here the other one. I said, well, what is the law? What is the rule? What, what is the algorithm? How do you determine this? And you cannot pinpoint it. They will not be able to do so. The next thing is, they will tell you, well, bring a single contradiction or something. Well, then you do. Like, for example, I'm, I'm now doing this to somebody. I'm, I'm playing games with them because I'm saying, here's alcohol. It says it's good, it's bad, it's evil. Which one is it? Is a contradiction? No, it's not because at that moment it was that, aha. So if it's that moment, does that mean the Quran is only valid for that moment in time? You know, I'm playing games with them. I'm, I'm using their own um, interpretation, their own claims against them because I know the consequences and I know the whole spiel. And this is the, exactly the thing that you need to learn because you are brilliant at being a skeptic. But you don't have the background because you can, you can use three different things. You either you use the Quran, like you said, and, and take that underneath them, or you go and let them make a claim about what it means and, and what is good. Or, that. or you can go and, and just say, okay, what is it that you believe and why you believe it? This epistemology, epistemology approach that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, if you go for the Quran, you need to know the contents. You need to know where is this dualism? What does it say about that? For example, there's one surefire approach, which you could always use, which is bulletproof. And they, I've never found a Muslim who could do anything about it because they don't know about it. There's no script. That, because you also realize that they try and go back on their script. There's no script. Because it says a lot of times in the Quran, you're supposed to be good to your parents. But there is one instance where the scribe messed up. And instead of saying, you are commanded to be good to your parents, he says, it is forbidden for you to be good to your parents. But <laughs> Muslims don't realize that. And this is why they go absolutely apeshit if you tell them, okay, but you need to, you know, you lead, you need to lead them into the story. Do what do you think is haram? Can haram be command or good or beneficial or something? No, haram is always this. Okay. Here, there is one usage of haram. Is this haram good or haram bad? No, haram bad. You're not allowed to subscribe um, any partners or ascribe any partners to Allah. Yeah, but it says you are, it is forbidden not to allow this, not to do this. And then if you take it is forbidden, and then you take the second one, which is to be good to your parents. So it is forbidden to be good to your parents. And then you should see the head explode in slow motion. <laughs> this would be awesome if, if I sort of get that information. And maybe, you know, if as you do videos or if you point me to some of the videos you might have done. I've already. done this in a video. I've, oh, I've done, done the mistake uh, in the Quran. Maybe you can send me a link to that and I'll have a look at that because then I can go there. Obviously, I don't. If they've got some refu refutation, I can listen to it. Uh, and I may or may not in the moment have something to say about it because I don't always need information if they make a fallacy or if they say something stupid um, or incorrect you know i can i can spot that immediately however if if they then go into a long spiel i'll let them do it and, and hopefully i can record it and then for example yourself or other people can respond to it because i may not have the probably won't have the knowledge to respond there and then in, in an extended dialogue but i can certainly ask questions and put this out there and see what the response is because the other thing that i'm very careful of is not going there like some people do and go say, oh, I'm going to go and show these guys up because I'm, I'm not that good, particularly on the Quran uh, or the Hadith for that matter, that if they come back with something else, then I can then answer them again. So in that sort of sense, I'm much more it's exploratory examination. Here's what do you think about this? And they can give me an answer. I guess, hang on a moment. That doesn't make sense. Um, or maybe it does. And I don't have a refutation for it. So I'm happy to go out and, and have those conversations and ask these questions but it may well be that, as I say, I can't take it to the logical conclusion 
you know, depending on, on the knowledge, unless, you know, it's just automatically, you know, fallacious or whatever the case may be. But, but yeah, I'd love to be able to do more of that because I think, you know, they're so used to the, the normal arguments and most people don't go there knowing any of these sort of things. So, and I'm happy to learn on the spot. You know, I've recorded videos. I wish every single interaction of mine was recorded because I don't mind if I've been made mistakes or whatever the case is. What I notice is my mistakes are generally not catching their mistakes more than I've made, you know, epistemological mistakes in my own worldview. And so um, that's the kind of thing I'm quite happy to learn. And, you know, I don't mind being a guinea pig and, and so forth. You know, like this conversation I had with Shabir, et cetera. Um, there's been lots of commentary on that, et cetera. So I don't mind that. Um, but, but these sort of questions would be very interesting if I can go with one or two questions that I can pose to multiple different people and get their responses and see what, what they come back with. Right. Yeah, because you are being incredibly patient. Um, I would never be able to do that. <laughs> I think for me as well as what I notice is a lot of people shout over each other and I don't think you get anywhere. Um, I, I, and that may be that I'm being a little bit too patient as, as you point out. Um, I want them to be able to say something, but what I am looking for is more concise answers. And of course, my, the response I get from commenters and other people, particularly commenters on YouTube, et cetera, is, oh, well, you know, you're trying to force people into your way of thinking, et cetera. And I'm quite clear that that's not what I'm doing. What I am saying is if, if the other person like me wants a greater understanding or wants to get towards truth, and I'm saying to them, you're going about in a long way or you, you're not helping me to understand what you're doing by going in this, you know, windy route, maybe you want to rephrase it. If somebody says to me, Rob, I don't understand what you said. Can you rephrase that? I'm going to go, okay, what part don't you understand? Let me see if I can make that more concise or clearer for you. And that's not what I'm hearing from some of my interlocutors there. And so, you're right, it may be a case of jumping in quicker because otherwise I have a five-minute monologue and now I've got to try and go back and think live in the moment of how to refute five different things that were being said. Exactly. Now I can't find this video. Can you believe it? <laughs> That's all right. Has this been... Re I mean, I, because the thing is, my channel... But I used to I used to have a, a, like a, a really good grip on everything. And then they closed me down. Then I restarted. They closed me down. Who, and who, now who I restructured everything. Who closed you now? Uh, YouTube. No, I was at war with a thousand and one inventions, okay? And then they went, if they couldn't handle my criticism because I then got involved with the United Nations where they were trying to make some inroads and they didn't like that at all. You, inroads as in? What, what do you mean? Um, I, I, well, they asked me, well, what is it about 1001 inventions that are not above board and blah, blah, blah. And I said to them, well, all you need to do is just ask them a direct question. Ask them this, ask them this, ask them this. And apparently they did. And they said, well, where did you get this from? Well, this is from stuff spamming, from, from, um, from they, they use my blog. And then they got highly upset uh, when I made videos exposing all the lies that they are pushing out. And then they said, no, this is not acceptable. And then they gave me some DMCAs and um, my channel got closed down. Then it got put up again because people realized there's nothing to DMCA here and, and so on. And then in the end, they used uh, a false attack that I was uh, spreading hate or something. Oh, dear. So the 1001 ideas is, is related to Islam or is it a separate? 1001 Inventions is a company in Manchester. Oh, and okay. what, what, they are a Muslim Brotherhood uh, hood outfit, and they are sponsored through Saudi Arabia to get to children. So what they do is they take uh, scientific experiments, make them hands-on, and then run exhibitions all over the planet so that they get kids coming in, and they have little models, and the kids can push little plungers and can touch and move and see things happening. You know what kids like. And then... They are being told, well, this is because Islam is so much scientific, unlike the Christians who think that Earth is 6,000 years old and blah, blah, blah. Islam is actually at the forefront. And then they, they lie like that. And they come up with, with this idea as well, Islam is so wonderful because it, they invented flying. Um, like Mr. Firnas in Cordoba flew all over Spain with his gliders, which is absolutely not true. If you go to the basis of this, you find a poem which was mocking an old guy who put some eagle feathers in his body and then jumped off a building and broke his legs. <laughs> Dear God. And this is then, then you see a thousand and one invention saying, this is a replica of the glider that Firnas used. 
I mean, what the hell is going yeah. on here? Yeah. Then they say Khwarizmi. Well, he was the one who invented algebra because his book, Algebra and blah, blah, and this led to algebra. And algorithm is actually Al Khwarizmi. And, you know, they get nonsense like that. Well, it's great that people like you are able to go and look into these things because most Western people won't. And I think there's a, a perception here in the West, in the UK, the US, let's not antagonize, let's not marginalize Muslims. And exactly. you know, I'm not doing that. And I think most fair minded people aren't doing that. We are looking at the ideology and we're looking at certain people, how they behave, like you say, the thousand and one inventions, etc. And that, that I don't paint a broad brush of Muslims in general and no honest. Uh, crit a critic does either. You know, I, I obviously follow Sam Harris, Dawkins, and, and many other ACS, and there's things that they say that I don't agree with as well. But you know, and I'm very well versed on on many of the Sam Harris books and and views, etc. And, and I've never once heard him, for example, say all Muslims. In fact, he's been at pains not to say that. But of course, you know, it's like throwing crap at, at people. Some of it'll stick, even if it's not true. And so, you know, but I see Western people in general very. A timid about doing that, apart from the outspoken people like a Geert Wilders or a Ian Hersey Ali, and, and maybe you know Harris could be in there to some degree as well. Um, those are the sort of people who will say it up, but most people are, are very fearful of saying anything in case they get labeled Islamophobe or whatever the case is, which is just a nonsense term anyway. Um, but they, you know, people are very fearful of doing that because the moment one person does it, then it's like, oh, there's anti hate attacks and all this sort of stuff going on here, so people are like coward into not looking into this and speaking up against it. Yeah, this is true. And this is why people like you are so important who go on the ground and show this then to thousands of people. This is why it's so brilliant. And the thing is, you have the patience to do that. I get far too emotional, far too quickly, and I would immediately jump on them because I know all the arguments. I've heard them. I've been there. I've, I've, def I've, I've debunked them. So, you know, I, I would jump on them much, much quicker than, than what you do. Yes, and maybe from my point of view, it could be a bit frustrating listening, watching some of my videos because I am very patient. You go, Rob, jump in here, jump in there. And, you know, in, in time, I'm sure <laughs> the more I do it, the probably I'll, I'll hear it more and I'll, I'll probably jump in again. I don't want to get to the point where I'm jumping in nonstop and, and somebody can't finish a sentence. But I think I will get to the point where I will jump in quicker when I notice a fallacy and deal with it there and then or, or some problem that comes up because doing a monologue is, is just isn't helpful. Uh, a, for me to follow along with, because it's easy as an armchair expert to watch and go, oh, you should have picked this up, should have picked that up. You know, and I'm not an experienced debater, and hopefully over time I'll, I'll get better. But the live conversation, we don't know what the, the next thing the person is going to say. is very different from watching it, you know, in the, in the comfort of your armchair. And I watch other debates and I go, goodness, look at all these mistakes. And I even look at myself sometimes and go, look at the mistakes you missed there, here and there. But it's very different when you're in there. Uh, and that's why I love if I do on occasion see some some experts in whatever the field. There was a guy called, I think, Philip or Phil that came down there who was a cosmologist. And he had this video. You might have to look it up or I can try and send it to you. We had this conversation with the bus. He was the guy that sort of interjected when I was speaking to Hamza with the red beard. Um, gave me this monologue on, um, you know, the lexic lexicon or, you know, the, the, the way the Quran is written so wonderfully, etc., which to me on the face of it is just nonsense. Uh, but I'm not in a position to, to, apart from saying, you know, from my point of view, I could bring any book and come up with numbers and split things up and find ways to make it sound like it's wonderful. Um, and so that for me is unconvincing entirely. And you know, I'm nowhere near that point anyway, where you're going to, you know, so you can talk about that, that's fine. Um, but that's of, you know, very little interest to me, for example. But, but that particular conversation, I immediately heard this cosmologist. He was trying to explain to, to Abbas about cosmology. And, you know, I just know enough to know that I, when I hear experts speaking, and I, I would have been like, tell me more. I want to shut my mouth and you can educate me. And, of course, it was one of the most frustrating videos I'd watched. Was Abbas would just try and jump in and, and kind of give you his little bit. And it's like, you know, somebody talk, you know, that's completely uneducated talking to an absolute expert. And that was the case. And, you know, that's what I, I want to see more of. But, I, you know, I don't know when they're coming and, you know, so forth. And so I'd love to have more people like that because I'm not like that. But I know just enough to recognize when I hear an expert speaking on a particular topic. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is and this is quite quite sad um, that, that you can hear these things and you can pick them up, but they can't. Uh, one thing I've, I've worked out, I don't know why they can't think in concepts or in, in, in abstract form. For, for them, it's very difficult. They, they need, you push the switch and then the light comes on. But to go, I, I noticed this uh, when, when Sarah was discussing this with oh, this, this redhead guy, red, red beard guy. Yeah, Hamza. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Hamza, there you go. And 
he, he was trying to tell him or show him that objective and subjective are different things on a different level. He could not understand it. He was, was this a unable. recent discussion? Was this a discussion that uh, was recorded recently for about an hour? Yes. Okay, because I also watched that. And I have to say, if, if I'm sort of fair-minded, and I try to be, and obviously we all have cognitive bias, and you and I are probably you know, critical, and I would hold my hand up, I'm more critical of religion than, say, the man in the street, just because I'm more skeptical of that. Um, and obviously religious people are much more likely to accept whatever's heard, whereas I'm, I'm much more skeptical. But I, I attempt to be, and I, I'm hands up, I'm not perfect by any stretch, but I attempt to be fair-minded. And I watched that, that hour's debate, and I went, you know what, in the beginning... Um, Sarah definitely could have posed that whole question around, you know, the intelligibility of, of Allah a lot better, and, and it didn't stay there. But yeah. to be fair, um, as soon as he got onto the race thing, he, it just went off the board. And so if I, and I was thinking about actually saying to you, hey, we should do a, we should do sort of a combined, we should run that video at some point, and you and I give comments on that. You can comment on what you think, you know, Hamza did badly, and I'll comment on what I think Sarah made a mess on. Um, because to be fair, both of them, you know, screwed up at some point, you know, with his old ancestors yeah, and all that I sort agree. of stuff. I agree. Uh, but you're right. I think it, we, those sort of discussions are interesting because, you know, you can look at it from an armchair point of view if you weren't there. I thought, you know, next time maybe I'll be there as well and I'll be sort of the either the moderator or the third person because I can objectively listen to the two of them because I don't, I, I don't subscribe to either of their position, but I'll do my best to go, okay, you've made a point. Please, Sarah, answer this or, you know, Hamza, answer this. The one thing I would say about Hamza, you know, is he does attempt to answer questions directly and concisely. Whether we agree with the position or not, that's a completely different thing. Uh, and that part is the one thing that he will go, okay, yes, no, or X, Y, and Z, whereas, you know, some other Muslims don't do that. And I noticed Sarah didn't do that. So when he was pressed on the point of, you know, do you think that, you know, blacks are superior to whites. He goes, oh, they're the ancestors. Now, I'm going to challenge him on this particular thing on Sunday because, you know, I agree with him, obviously, with his point of view about, you know, Islam. But again, you know, he's coming with a point of view which he, in his own view, says is crazy. And that's fine. But I think it's a charitable thing if people ask you about your views. Presumably, you have views for what you think are good reasons. If you don't, you know, that's perhaps an incoherent view. And, and you're welcome to challenge other people. And, and you don't have to you know, present your view in order to critique theirs. But I think it's charitable if people ask you that you give an honest account of what you believe and why. And then we can see, you know, do you? And if you go, hey, it's crazy, don't ask me why it's crazy. Well, that's fine. But that's kind of a little bit hypocritical of saying, okay, well, I'm crazy, but I'm going to challenge you either rightly or wrongly on your views. So, you know, I, I'm definitely going to have a conversation with Sarah because I don't think it's, it's all a one-way street. It certainly wasn't in that, in that debate as far as I could see. Yeah, I've also found it a pity that, that he, he opened himself up. And, and this is why I thought, why are you doing that? You, you don't need to. Yeah, I think because, because the kind of people have got an idea now of, you know, what is he talking about with the answers and stuff? They try to press him on the ancestors thing. And he kind of semi-answered, but then he didn't. And I think, you know, if I was in his position or if there was a small piece of advice is, hey, go and think about these and, and think about some answers here. You can decide and you can choose not to answer people, but I think people will then be less charitable about wanting to have a discussion with you if you're not prepared to share your views and defend them. And if you say, well, my views are mine and I don't care or I haven't got good reasons, um, you know, even from my point of view, because I'm a little bit more sympathetic towards the panentheist view, because if, if there were a supernatural being, which of course, which I think we both agree there's mountains of evidence that, that one would need in order for that to be true. But if there were, I'm more sympathetic towards the panentheist view because the implications of that are much better than the implications of a you know, monotheistic, you know, ancient sort of God. Interestingly enough, I will bring this up actually. When I was an atheist, and, and here's something you may have heard about it, but I'd be interested in your thoughts. If you haven't read it, it might be worth a read at some point because you know you know such a lot on, on Islam. But the one book that I read when I was about 2008, when I was definitely an atheist, but I wouldn't have considered myself that, was a book called Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. I don't know if you've read that or heard about it. I've heard about it. Uh, have I read it? I don't remember. I'm you know, a fairly staunch atheist, but... If there were a God, that would be the sort of God that I would be open to having a, some kind of interaction with were it demonstrated to be true. Now, I had to read the book a few times because there's certain things in there that are, that are so um, different to what you would hear anywhere else. So it's, it's a guy 
basically was down on his luck, etc., cetera, and, and sort of asked in a nasty way, well, God, if there is such a freaking thing, why is life all crap? And he, you know, claims to have had, you know, what we call a through me experience. In other words, he sat there and suddenly started to write and he started to write answers to the things that he was saying, either in his mind or out loud. And so this is how the books developed. Uh, and I've met the guy in person. So he came here to the UK. I went to a five day retreat way back when, when I was really into looking into more of this. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a nice enough guy, but at no stage does he claim to be a guru or anything like this. He he just basically sits there and answers questions a bit like, you know, Dalai Lama, but he's the first person to say, I'm not a Dalai Lama, I'm just a normal guy. I had these experiences. This is what quote unquote God said to me. But if you read some of the verses, you read some of the responses to his questions, um, it is quite a interesting, a little bit, you know, um, astounding in some sense and sometimes very challenging but if there were a god and, and i've read the three introductory books um, more than once um, that would be the sort of god that i could accept a non an unconditionally loving god that doesn't um, have, have any will for humanity other than them to have their own experience of whatever they choose to have on earth but that sort of belief is so alien to a human you know to a religious person <laughs> because they have this innate need for for cosmic justice and the fact that we have to follow some rules. And to me, you know, my thing is, A, there's no, you know, there's not good evidence to believe that there is a supernatural, but if there was, then you've got to get to the point of it's a particular supernatural. And then for me, it's almost insurmountable thing of the moral question. And for me, a God that could, that isn't unconditionally loving is a bar that I'm not prepared to accept. So unless the God was unconditionally loving, if there were such a thing, there's just no way I could accept it because I feel like I'm on, the, on a par from a morality point of view. Uh, and this is one thing the religious, be it Christian or, or Muslim, just cannot really co gain a concept of. Yeah, and, and this is the thing. If you go and you construct your own God, would you go and construct the God of Islam? No, there's no way anybody would do that. So why do people worship and 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 you know, go crazy about this God. Would you create a Muhammad? I mean, he, he was, I mean, yeah, the things that this guy did and people worship this guy. Why? Why I think it's, is it that people do not have this view of reality and are not able to do what you just did? And that is say, if I were to create a God that I would worship, it would look like this. And now let me compare it to what we have in the Quran. Well, that's another thing, by the way. I think worship is immoral. If you had an all-powerful yeah. creator, and again, if you read, there was a lovely lady that actually came from, I think it was Qatar or whatever, and she came a couple of times to Speaker's Corner, and I suggested to her at one point, hey, get this book and read it. Uh, and I'm not telling her to change religions or to dump Islam or whatever. I said, hey, go read this. And if you've got questions, send me an email or you know, message me or whatever. But I find that a lot of religious people have an innate need for some kind of authoritarian figure of some kind outside of humanity to give them, you know, law, morality, et cetera, et cetera. And the thought of not doing that seems very alien, which to me is an alien thought, but for them, I guess <laughs> it's an alien thought of, of being in this wilderness without any supervising, you know, divine supervising authority, as Christopher Hitchens used to say. Yeah. And, and so, you know, but, but worshiping, I think, is an immoral act anyway. This is an all supposedly all powerful, you know, in my world, if there were such a thing, let's call it an immensely powerful being if there were such a thing, because, you know, the, you know, the omni attributes are self-contradictory if you look into it a little bit more, which I'm sure you have. Um, and so an immensely powerful being that cannot be hurt or harmed in any way is now going to torture and, and um, yeah, you know, yeah. punish people for eternity. This is just immorality at the highest level. Uh, and so... You know, I'm saying there would be no need for worship. And of course, if you read the conversation with God books, it's more an interaction. Here's how you can have a conversation. Again, one would need to demonstrate that that's not your imagination, but actually that's addressed. So the guy asks, you know, for example, you know, how come, you know, what is it, you know, how is it that I get you real and it's not my, my imagination? And the basic answer is what would be kind of along the lines of what would be the difference? I could speak to you in any which way, you know, and the way you will know it is me is because you would never have been able to speak with such clarity. And if you read some of the things here, um, and I'm quite a skeptical guy, um, you go, OK, and I've met this guy in person, you know, I'm very skeptical that he could have done this all by himself. It's not impossible. But if you read the entire thing and you look at it broadly and then you look at certain parts, um, you go, OK, either there was somebody incredibly smart or there was a massive conspiracy here to to put this out there. And that could all be true. 
Uh, and and that's the other great thing is you know if you were look, looking into this part of this goes take the parts that you want and reject the rest and in no other spiritual book of any kind that i've ever heard of you know does it say oh well choose the bits that will work for you or for humanity or whatever and and the other bits you know reject them if you don't think x y and no, z that's just reject them. No. No. um so it's a fascinating read um but again you know i am skeptical of, of all of that and so but if there were as i say that would be the sort of divine figure that one could have an interaction with. i would never feel worship the moment the worship was thrown in there then i'm going okay that's not a god that i would want to have any sort of interaction even if it was true i'd be going bugger it it's true god damn it you know exactly. uh, yeah. i'll, I'll yeah. unwillingly accept it but i'm certainly not going to have any relationship with it whatever it may be no i i, I quite openly call these gods that they have constructed these abrahamic gods they're monsters they're the incompetent monsters and that's that's it you, and blah 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 and everything that Dawkins says in his book yeah yeah and I don't agree with everything that Richard Dawkins says so of course no. occasionally you'll get you'll get a couple of the, the Muslims that will come down and go oh, you guys worship or you follow x y and z and um, I think they've got a very different idea they, they actually think we follow them in the same way that we'd follow Mo they follow Muhammad or something this is the point you cannot this is why I asked if, if you understand the theist because I do not understand theist I've had discussions with Christians with Muslims with I do not speak the same language. I do not think in the same way that they do because they have this permanent filter in front of them, which I don't have. This is the problem. Yes, so they've got a religious filter. So when they hear you say something, they interpret it in the same way as they view the world. So they have a, a you know a book and and a messiah or a you know supervising authority that tells them what to do. And so when we as non-believers talk about Dawkins or Harris or whoever it might be, they automatically filter that in the sense of, oh, well, you must be following them word for word and you just believe whatever they say. Mm. Uh, and of course, as you and I know, that's not the case at all. We listen to it, I'll evaluate it. Yes, this seems very good. And then I'll go out there and ask other people, well, what do you think? Because maybe there's something I've missed. You know, you know, and I can openly say there's definitely things that, that Dawkins in particular has said that I go, no, that's you know, the, the problem of regress, for example, I, I don't buy into that at all. Um, you know, I'd have to be really shown that that, that regress is is a is an argument that, that a non-believer can bring to a believer. You know, it just philosophically it just doesn't make sense. And yet Dawkins continues to use that as, as an example. You know, well, if God created X, who created God? The moment I hear that, I'm like a red flag. Even Lawrence Krauss brings it up and I'm going, guys, take some time to look into this. I know you're experts in your particular field, but if you bring up those sort of statements have take some time to look into it you know regress is just not a seems to me a um, philosophically a point from which you can argue at some point there was something that has quote always been there or whatever term you want to use otherwise you are into this infinite past and what happens i mean that could be infinite but it, it just there's no way to demonstrate that and that seems a challenge you know, the, the thing that I, because sources used to use that, and, and I said, no, number one, you're kidding yourself, and number two, what is wrong with it? And then I left it, because there's absolutely no point to talk about it. Mm. I don't really much I mean, I'm open to it. If, if there was a good argument, maybe one of your videos, again, you know, I go where the evidence goes, and, and as much as yeah. sometimes there's an ego going on a little bit at Speaker's Corner and, and wherever it is, ultimately, I'd rather be wrong and, and be follow the truth than be right and be ignorant or, or not follow what is, is clearly the truth and you know i've looked into a number of different things and i'm particularly looking into apologetics at the moment because obviously this whole thing about rationality that the muslims are bringing up um, is one of the things that they challenge atheists with and of course this has been roundly refuted now from really intelligent people on the internet and and, and philosoph uh, uh, philosophers etc because obviously it was originally a christian thing and so you know i'm very confident even if i don't have all the proper answers now this for me is a you know once they've heard it and it's been refuted it would now be a dishonest position to come to speaker's corner with the whole thing about oh, okay. i didn't know it had been read because I, I listened because you you brought this up on sunday so i found um one by imran hussein and one by um Sotsis. yes and so they're challenging obviously the rationality how do we as non-believers account for rationality in a naturalistic world yeah, but that's old I mean, this is what what Sources used to do like two years ago because it's the old because he, he thought he was onto something here because he, he said yeah it's it's this um, the hard problem I said it's, what what is hard about it well it's a hard problem of consciousness I said okay how difficult is it to say I do not know because they always harp on about the three things um, origin of universe origin of life and consciousness yes so what yeah absolutely right so what. 
I mean, if I, I can say I do not know yet how this works. I know that without a brain, you cannot have consciousness. And that's it. That's for me, the case is closed. Yes, you know, and this is more from a philosophical point of view. And uh, um, the fact that it's, you know, for me, I'm, I'm very certain now that this has been refuted by really smart guys to the point where I'm battling to follow along. And I, I'm, you know, sort of looking into philosophy, but I'm no, not even a student, I wouldn't call that. But I'm listening and I'm rewinding and listening again. Uh, and, you know, smart, I'm very confident if Tzortzis or any of these other boys, even if I can't answer it, and I'm going to do my best to do so. Um, but even if I can't, if I put them in touch with one of these guys and we had a hangout, that this would be refuted. It would be, this this boat is sunk. Let's get on to something else. And if you bring this up again, I'm going to have to really, you know, call you out for being dishonest because now this is a non-argument. So you're right. He, he's obviously sounds to have brought this up before, but but that touches on another point, which is, you know, your, your point about we don't know. We are comfortable saying we don't know this. Um, the, the moment we do this, they jump in, oh, well, we've got the answer and we have a level of certainty that they can't possibly justify. Sure. Uh, the whole God of the gaps, which, you know, is such an old well, show thing. Me, show, me, show me the process. Give me, give me the methodology. You got it. Give me an epistemological and that's it. argument They're for why this is true. Don't just assert it because, you know, and so what they do, and of course, you know, they borrow from William and Lane Craig. And so they borrow a lot from the, the Christians who have kind of attempted to refine these sort of arguments. The best they can get to, even if we were in, you know, supremely charitable is that there's some kind of the deistic type creator. If we were immensely charitable, they've now got to get to a specific one. And th that leap is even bigger, in my opinion, than the leap of, you know, and, and that leap and the leap of the original deistic sort of a God is, is huge already. But the next leap is even bigger, not to them, to them. It's, it's straightforward. Once you believe there's a God, well, then getting to our God is straightforward. And I listen to so-called arguments. I'm going, that bridge is twice as big as, as the original bridge. <laughs> but, it, but for them, it's a process of reduction, you know. So, he, and you might have heard the guy, have a look up, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, there's a Christian guy there that's, that seems to be a reasonably good apologist for Christianity. He's not Jay, but it's one of Jay's sort of colleagues there. Um, he does live debates as well. Jonathan McClatchy or something. Have you heard of him? Never heard of him. Type in Jonathan McClatchy. McClatchy, I think it is. I stay away from Christians. Oh, I get okay. too frustrated. <laughs> but, you know, he brings up the whole Craig sort of thing. And, and, it, and, and their sort of view is, oh, it's a mm. cumulative place. So it's the case of intelligent design, you know, cosmology, the ontological, the teleological, etc. And so they're trying to build this, quote, case. This is the new approach because we, we've got no one argument that's even close to it. So we'll try and bring up all of these. In a, in a sort of a reductionist point of view of reducing, well, it has to be this because, you know, the, the universe coming about by chance is just so astronomically impossible that it's nobody in their right <laughs> mind could accept it. And you're like, goodness gracious. Then you listen to, if you want to watch a great, you may have seen it really, but a great debate is between Sean Carroll and William Lane Craig. Now, Carroll is a cosmologist, as you may know. He's my hero. Yeah. Uh, this is and, where I copied, I don't know if you've seen in my videos, I love this, I copied this from him. Um, I hope he's never going to come and, and charge me copyright because I would have to pay him a dollar every time I use it. <laughs> that is false. I loved it. I mean, the second time around when he said, I'm starting to get frustrated because Dr. Craig is giving this and he's saying that that is false. And then it's false because da -da -da -dum. then Dr. Craig says, listen, that is false because da -da -da -dum. I loved it. And I'm copying this. That is false. I love it. This is such so... I, 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 I thought it was brilliant. I mean, I, I have a serious man crush on the guy, really, because I think Carol is is one of the, the most brilliant brains on this planet. Very, very concise, to the point, um, intellectually honest. And I have to put on, you know, and again, you know, I will call out things that I don't feel is, is right. And um, I like Krauss in the sense of I like, I've read the book, uh, Universe from mm -hmm. Nothing, multiple times to sort of get an understanding. And it's an amazing, if you look at it, you know, forget about the, the word nothing and the connotations or not, but the whole no, journey of how we've feel, got yeah. to know what we know about the cosmos now is just yeah. incredible how we've, you know, found out about the last scattering service and, and um, standard candles and the geometry of the universe and measurements, you know, and I heard uh, you know, Anand Rashid on one of the videos go, oh, we have no idea how big the universe is. Yes, we do very accurately now, more accurately than we've ever had in history. Yeah. We know exactly, not exactly, but within a billion kilometers, which is a very small amount, how big the universe is. And so, you know, we've got a lot of this information. But Krauss, when I, if you watch him debate, he's, he's not a great debater, number one. No. And there's a lot of ad hominems. I mean, he attacked Hamza, 
uh, taught us. Yeah, okay, that's my fault. How's that? Um, because I coached him before this. Oh, did you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what we did is we sat down and then we had, I, don't, I can't remember, one or two hours. And I said to him, okay, these are the pointers because he had just um, debated another Muslim. And then it turned out that he's going to debate uh, Tzotzis. Mm -hmm. And everybody said, no, go to Star Family. He's the expert on Tzotzis because this was at a stage when I was really like locked on this guy. And, and well, it worked. <laughs> anyway, so we got together and then I said to him, listen, you need to get him off balance. And the way to get him off balance is do not let him go into his script, into his routine of opening 15 cans of worms. He's going to go with three, and then from there he's going to expand, and he's going to drive you crazy. I'm not sure that he's crazy enough to open cosmology. And he did, <laughs> which I thought was absolutely remarkably stupid. And I said, but what you need to do is you need to constantly heckle him. You need to go and make sure that he does not get comfortable because he is a great talker, he's a great entertainer, and he knows when to put in a joke and when to make us, you know, give people a smile and, and when, when to ask for the takfir and things like that. Don't let him do that. Constantly keep him on his toes, and he did. <laughs> Cool, you know, there's no, there's different there's different things. I just, from my point, and he did the same with William Lane Craig as well. And, and there were a few ad hominems thrown in, particularly with Craig, which I went, do you know what? I, I'm not a fan of Craig in any way, but again, I, I'm attempting to be, you know, dispassionate here and just watching because I want to hear the information. But I do agree that, you know, there is a perspective where it's a win-lose. And I see a lot of Muslims wanting to go, okay, we've, you, you know, and Hamza says, you know, uh, Darren Hamza, which is red bearded Hamza. Darren is his, uh, is his original name. Oh, you know, okay. I rinsed you and I did this, that, and the other thing. And I'm going, okay, that's a different perspective on it. And I understand that's a, a different <laughs> okay, way of a, doing it. A childish. Yeah, but there were no ad hominems with, with Craig. Um, with William Mancari. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if, if I remember, well, again, it depends whether what you call an ad hominem. It was at least very uncharitable, telling him how uh, immoral he was, etc. instead of sticking to the facts. The reason why... Ah, oh, but won't, that's not an ad hominem. Yeah, the but reason why this man is just audience. so immoral, it's just ridiculous. And I'm going like, Jesus, Lawrence, just get on with it. Don't tell us about oh, okay. not here yeah, to, the... for you to attack his character. Attack the arguments, if, if that's what you want to do. But tell us how bad he is and how immoral he is because he thinks children should be slain and go to go to heaven and so forth. I agree that those are you know pretty outrageous views, but that's not part of the argument here. Why would you bring that up here? You know, What's the point of that? Okay. So he wandered around the stage and he would... And, and Craig sat there quite calmly. I have to I have to say that. And I was like, do you know what? That's where that's where the difference is. Carol didn't do any of that. He just ran for the arguments. And to me, I learned a lot more from that. I was like cringing a little bit with with Krauss in those sort of things. I'm going, do you know what? Maybe we agree, but is that something that you want to bring up in an intellectual argument with, you know, somebody who's not a stupid guy? Yes, we can disagree profoundly with his views, but do we need to attack him on his moral views? We could, but that's not even part of the argument. So why kind of bring that? What's your point of doing that? You know, it, it's not going to change any Christians' minds. Uh, and in fact, it might even put people off going, yeah, you're a bit of a snob or you're a bit of an ass, you know, because he could have done the same. Krauss, you, you short ass idiot, you know, why are you X, Y? You don't know anything about philosophy because Krauss is famous for going, you know, I don't care, philosophy is useless, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, when any, whenever he's presented with some kind of philosophical point, he bumbles that entirely. So his cosmology obviously is ace with that. But you ask him philosophical questions and he literally goes around the point, doesn't answer it, etc. So, you know, it's a bit disingenuous to go and attack somebody else on an, on an unrelated point, I thought. You know, it's just my view. Okay. Well, I agree with you and I disagree. Mm. Because I agree with you to the extent that you should not go in an intellectual environment to go and um, commit about what I call ribbings or, or mm -hmm. uh, veiled threats or insults rather. Um, but then I disagree because I think he doesn't deserve any better because he's he's an immoral asshole, and I think it's it's his way of Krauss's way of saying to him, "Listen, guy, I can not only deal with you on a factual level, but I also think that you, you're a cripple," and and this is the whole point. And I think I I used to be like that. If you watch my my older video, videos that I made like like six years ago or so. There I was also very polite and I'm, I'm not criticizing this. I'm just going, you know, for the claims and, and, and I'm not bashing anything and very, very um, polite. I don't do that anymore because I think in the 21st century, now 2016, everybody 
should know by now the inconsistencies within Islam. And I think it is disingenuous to somebody to come to me now and say, give me one contradiction in the Quran. That's an asshole. Because yeah. he knows exactly that he can go to Google, uh, to Google to Google and enter their contradictions in the Quran and he will get 550,000 different answers to his question. So I hate these assholes and I will tell him, listen, you're an asshole. You're a liar. You know exactly that you can do that. And if you know exactly that if I'm going to give you one, you're going to start arguing. Yes, and, and, I, and I think that's the difference, I guess. You're much further down the line. You've been through all of this for years, so you, you've got far less tolerance, and I, I totally accept that. And it could be that, I've radicalized myself. <laughs> and, I, and I could be, in years' time, a lot less tolerant as well. Um, I hope I will always, you know, there'll be some room for that. But again, I think it could get to the point where you hear the same thing, and particularly from the same people. I think that's where... I think my patients could also run short when it's people that have, you know haven't heard this before and you're having an interaction with somebody you haven't spoken to and they're perhaps not that knowledgeable i'm not going to pound on them or jump on them or anything like that i'd rather try and point out where i think they're going wrong but with the guys that do know this and particularly if something has been refuted or we know for a fact that what they're bringing up you know has has been talked about and and you know as i say refuted before then i think it's dishonest and that's the times where i'll point that out so for example mm -hmm. hamza is an example i don't know if you pointed me to it but there's a long 150 page refutation of this embryology paper exactly. that he wrote this is uh, and I just, disguise and this is this he was part of our group rationalizer uh, disguise and me yeah and so from my point of view, if Hamza comes there again, sorts us, that is, talking about embryology, I'm going to present him with again with this because I've now got it on my phone. So that's the other thing. I start to gain knowledge. As I hear questions that I don't know or want to look into, I must have like 150 notes on my you know, phone. It's hard to find the damn things that I'm looking for. But whenever I hear a claim that I either don't know enough about or want to find out more, I'll go and look up and then I'll, I'll get some links. I'll find out some information. I'm not an expert, but I can then point to some refutations for this because otherwise you, you can't always you know, refute certain things. And, and, and inter, um, intuitively, it sounds like nonsense, but I don't always have something to immediately say. So I'm not going to say nonsense unless I've got something that can back me up. Because you know, yeah, I, I don't want to be foolish, but B, I, you know, I'm not somebody that's going to go and make a claim or like, sorry, did, oh, I'm going to come out there and Hamza, you next. And to be honest, he didn't accomplish, in my view, what he supposedly was going to do with Hamza, if I, if I again, if I'm honest. So making that claim then doesn't Absolutely. make you look yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm rather, let's go and find this out. And if I hear something in the live conversation, I'm going to pull that up. But I'm not going to, to anybody and say, hey, I'm going to come and rinse you or X, Y, and Z, unless <laughs> something has been utterly refuted. So if we can get to a point where the, the, this rationality thing can be utterly refuted, and I'm super confident, I'm, I have a reasonable level of confidence at the moment, having watched what I've watched, but somebody could still ask a question that I don't have an answer for. But I am very confident if I put them on with one of these experts, that will be refuted and they will not have an argument. And then they will, this will be the end of it. And you once that happens... Do you want to or do you want to wait until you come to it? Say again? You want to give me a taste or do you want to rather spring it on somebody? Um, well, basically, well, I can I can share with you some stuff because maybe we'll only put this live on Sunday anyway or something like that because uh, I've got it, you know. Okay, then, uh, then I'm listening on, on headphones, uh, cordless, but I'll get myself a beer. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so basically, this this whole rationality thing, is they were, there's two parts to it. One is um, from a philosophical point of view. They want us to account for rationality. The other is they want us to account from it from a naturalistic point of view. That's probably more where they're going for. On the philosophical point of view, they're asking us for to account for rationality using rationality, which is a circular argument. But they're in exactly the same position. All I have to show with this rationality argument is that we're on the same playing field. I'm not claiming that we have a better answer to rationality than they do. I'm claiming that we're all on the same playing field, singing from the same hymn sheet. These guys are claiming that they have an account for rationality that makes sense and is superior to the naturalistic point of view. Yep. So from a philosophical point of view, I think they've got zero ground to, to, to walk on. So the only thing they can appeal to is sort of, well, as Hamza did um, in this latest video, if you go and look online under... Um, let me just see if I can bring it up here. I actually had it here a moment ago. Uh, where is it? There was this discussion. If you go, if you are subscribed to Pathway to Truth, there's a, a, a fairly new video that was just uploaded recently, discussion on rationality and reason. Hamza Tortsis versus atheist. That particular atheist's name is Andy, and he's actually got some philosophical training. So if you listen to that debate, that was quite an interesting one, where he um, brought up 
what he felt was counters to Ham, Hamza's argument about this rationality. Because basically Hamza, or this Dawa, London Dawa school is, we can't oh, is account... This the, the one that you have here on the on the screen now playing on the on the right? Uh, could be. It does it start off with... Yeah, now playing discussion on rationality That's the one. and reality, That's the one. pathway to truth. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me copy paste that, put that in here, and then I'll watch this later. Yeah, this is obviously sort of a more high level. Most Muslims who are watching this, and particularly viewers around, will have no clue here. And I wouldn't necessarily, unless I've looked into this. I, again, I don't claim that I'm an expert on this. I've just looked into it. So from a philosophical point of view, they've got no standing. We're on the same ground. We are both taking this as a, as a what's called a properly basic belief and as an axiomatic assumption. We, we can't prove rationality because we have to use rationality to prove rationality. So it's circular yeah. for both of us. What they are claiming is that God gave it to them. Now, this is an <laughs> ontological claim, um, and they need to provide an argument for it because I could claim, and, and Andy's claimed, um, that there's a naturalistic process. And I could say, uh, which is you know, a possibility, that a random neurological firing in the brain at some point in our past history was the first spark of rationality. And, and I want them to refute this uh, because if they can't, then we're on the same point of view because what they're really asking for is epistemological. Well, how do you account for it? They can't do it either. What they can do is go, here's who did it for us. And I can do, here's what did it for us. And so as far as I'm concerned, we're on the same path. They will attack the naturalistic point of view as, as Hamza did in this particular video, but I still don't think they're on any stronger ground. And if there was an expert out there on this that I could point them to, they would debunk this. And so but I this is this... not the, the video where he says, well, you know, I've just studied this. I've just had a postgraduate course and it's called emergent, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, emergent materialism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the other one, which, which would be Tsortsis versus London black atheists or whatever. Those guys are unprepared for that. Those guys, yes. really nice guys. But really but this, is, throw up. this is a high level philosophical, really. Um, sort of thing, and that he's bringing in the so he's using fancy words, which exactly you know, which he doesn't understand. This is the problem. He's been doing that for as long as I know him. I, I'm, I'm, you know, you know him better than me, so you, you're probably speaking from you know better ground. I'm not convinced that he's stupid or that he doesn't know what it means. What I am convinced is that he's got some of the study, and he hasn't really come up against somebody who will who will refute this. And so he's speaking to people who are clearly not knowledgeable on the subject, and we and we'll hold our hands up. We're all not knowledgeable on something. Uh, and so they're arguing past each other. Uh, and so he's yeah. not getting an answer. And so the, uh, the, the video walks away with, quote, some atheist looking stupid. But that's easy to do with people who are not at your level. Let me put him in touch with one or two people who we can have that discussion with. And then we see whether he walks away looking smart. These arguments yeah, and it's are it's a pity that they are so afraid of me because I would love to have them on the show and I would love to have a chat with them. But they will not do that. You know, and I don't know what your what your sort of background is from a philosophical point of view. And you, you no, zero. Well okay. I don't like philosophy. Okay, I enjoy when it makes sense. I like the philosophy of science. I like philosophy when it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that philosophy philosophy is far overrated because at the end of the day, they are only talking and talking and talking without anything constructive happening. And that is when I say no. There there, there needs to be a cutoff. There needs to be a point at which stage you stop talking and you do. Okay, that is my level of philosophy. Now, I've, I've read a lot. I've, I've looked into many of these things and I have, I think, quite a good grip on these things. But I will not say that philosophy is the end, albeit, da 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 the way that some other people do it. Fair enough. And there I sort of agree and disagree. My disagreement is less than my agreement. I agree that philosophy, for the most part, isn't particularly useful in the in the normal day-to-day -day world. Where I do see it useful is backing up kind of rationality. So when you go into an argument, you are better armed to see fallacies, to be able to argue rationally. And, and yeah. if, particularly okay. if it's yeah. on a video... The video is not to convince the other person. The video is there for other people to view and go, oh, okay, let me look into this. Exactly. Unfortunately, most of my exactly. subscribers are not that intellectual, and, and this is not a dig at them. So if this goes onto the channel, it's not going, oh, you're stupid and I'm, and I'm brilliant. That's not the case at all. all I, they're not intellectually geared towards that, and I'm not to much of a degree. I'm learning more about it, so it's an interest to me. Somebody could school, quote, school me, which I hate that word, but somebody could school me on the Quran. You could tell me, and I wouldn't know one way or the other. And so I'm just learning a different facet of knowledge, for want of a better word. So it's, to some degree, it's interesting because I want to find out certain things. There was a, a brilliant um, 
uh, video recently where I looked into that I watched with Matt Slick, who's a Christian sort of apologist who's got these, um, I, I, I was live when he first called the, the atheist experience. Oh, so you watched the one with him and Dillahunty. Now, <laughs> if you're interested in that, go and watch a video with him and a guy called Matt. Um, oh, when they when they argue amongst each other, who is the better apologist for Christian for Christianity? No, no, yeah, yeah. no, 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 not that one. There's one where uh, a, f a philosopher of logic calls into the show because Matt Slick put out the thing basically going, hey, if somebody can, you know, you know, show me what's wrong with my tag argument, the transcendental, you know, supposedly transcendental argument for God's existence, which is all about the laws of logic. Let somebody call in. So it happens that this guy, Alex, who's a trained philosopher of 12 years on logic specifically, because philosophers, there's a wide variety of disciplines. So, mm -hmm. you know, so this guy who was specifically an expert on this particular field calls in, <laughs> and he was not there to tell him that, the God claim was wrong. What he was there to specifically do is to show him that, that the, the format of his argument, the premises and the conclusion were incorrect. The and I, who was not even close to being even a student of philosophy, got the understanding within five minutes. It took him <laughs> 20 minutes just to understand what, what this guy Alex was saying because he got confused with the way it was written. I think he probably got it quicker than that, but he's had this argument going for 20 years. And, of course, you're very... Um, invested in you know something that you be if somebody could come and refute something that you've been you know going around shouting from the rooftops for 20 years you're going to be very unlikely to want to let it go and this guy showed it exactly what was wrong from a from a, um, a validity point of view of the argument not necessarily the truth claim the itself, yeah. but just how the argument was completely malformed and he, at the end there's like a conclusion it's a two-hour conversation i was fascinated just because of this whole thing because here was a real guy that knew his stuff he's listening slick is trying to respond he's going no no it's like this it was like you know he knew he already knew what slick was going to say and it was fascinating to listen to somebody who's a real expert and i love de la by the way um i think he's brilliant he's a very good debater he's spot on and he's to the point and he doesn't take a lot of bull bullshit and that's i'd love to have him down in the speaker's corner that would be just brilliant if the man comes over i'll come and film him the whole day i mean he's brilliant but he's not at the level of of Alex and, and this guy Alex is obviously a trained philosopher for 12 years because Dillahunty is very good with philosophy but this guy is on a different level uh, and he bam bam went through this he's actually apparently because I watched another video of his he's he's explained to Dillahunty what what happened here and how he's dealt with this and this thing is this was a couple of years ago actually but it's 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 kind of all over the internet and so forth and so effectively the tag that. argument is dead but go and go and watch it it's fascinating that's the sort of person I'd want to put you know, Sorsis and a couple, Sorsis really, because his followers, you know, Imram and the other fellow that stands on the chair, they're his kind of disciples, for want of a better word. He's the he's the kind of main guy. The other guys are, are at a much lower level than him. So they come along yeah. with a couple of these sort of apologetic uh, presupposition arguments. It's not, and it's not easy because we attack it from the wrong way. And the other, guy, the other thing that one of these guys said is we are attacking it in the wrong way. We're trying to give them an answer. What we really should be doing is saying, hey, rationality, is a, is a properly basic belief you, from a philosophical point of view, you can't. And so what they're doing is going off on the net. How do you account for it in nature? How do you, because Schwartz's thing was, oh, well, if an atom hasn't got, um, what was it, rationality or the potential for rationality, well, how did it come into being type of thing? Well, kind of explain this to me. And that's what kind of Andy did, if you watch this video, to a degree, Andy sort of explained how if you put multiple atoms together, they have now have a potential to create something different than a single atom which is entirely plausible. And he used the example of water. So, you know, you've got hydrogen, oxygen on their own. They're just molecules. They're just atoms. As yeah. soon as you put them together, they then create something that has now got the property called wetness. Or in our case, you put together different particles. We now have the property called rationality or consciousness or whatever. Um, and so, you know, I don't, you know, that, that part of the argument, um, I don't think they, they're any better off than us. And their argument about God, they can't back that up. So even if my naturalistic view isn't a certainty, they, they can't make an argument that God gave us rationality other than to assert it. Well, he wouldn't have gone past me because the first thing that I realized is I would have said, yeah, but hang on, if it doesn't have the potential, you have just defined it as not being able to. And what he would say to you and then, it. well, you he can't. would say to you, well, has, has, has an atom got rationality? Or has it got the potential for rationality? It, everything has the potential for rationality. Okay, so his argument, if I play devil's advocate, will be, okay, so now you're making a positive claim, prove that it's got the, because all we know about atoms is that they've got energy and that they rotate around each other. So how do you demonstrate what argument or what, what could you point to that could show that it's got 
rationality. Well, it's very easy. Do we have rationality, yes or no? Well, we as humans do, but where? So his claim is that where did it come from? And if well, it's not from single see, atoms, this is the whole point. This is where I would say, well, we have rationality. It does originate somewhere in the brain. The brain is materialistic. It is consistent with um, what we know about the construction of matter, and that's it. End of story. So every atom has the potential of having rationality in the right combination. So this would be interesting, as you say, unfortunately, probably wouldn't come on with you, but it would be interesting because I think he would then attempt to quote people who say, no, well, can he use emergent materialism, which is essentially what you're talking about? Well, how does, how does consciousness, rationality, reason emerge or come out of naturalistic processes or natural you know, atoms, you know, using the reductionist argument? And even if we don't know, let's assume that we didn't know. That doesn't mean that you can you then plug in God as the answer. This is the other thing that I'm... That's the next thing, I, yeah. That's the but other the thing, thing is, does, does iron, if you take an element like iron, does it have the potential to float? It depends in what. Um, if you said in water... Exactly, no. this is the yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. Does uh, it have the potential to float? No. Well, then it, iron can never float. And yet, if you put it into a ship, it floats. Well, yeah, exactly. Although that's, then you're putting it into something else. And then there's, you know, man-made things that they would argue. So they're going from a naturalistic, if everything's just out there without, you know, a, an intelligent intervention, well, how does this happen? I guess that would be their point that they'd want to press. Because you can always go, well, put it in here. But who'd, his immediate point would be, okay, well, how did you get it in there? So a man put it in there. So, you know, let's equate that with God putting consciousness or rationally into our brain. You can assert that is my position, but you need to demonstrate, give me an argument, give me some reasons why I should believe that God put that into our brain or in some way infused into the universe. And if it's in the universe, well, how do we know it's in there and not from a naturalistic point of view? So yeah. um, I definitely want to pursue that more. But from a philosophical point of view, it's a dead duck. You know, there's no... Yeah, yeah. and this is why I have my magic bee, which is Maya. And, and Maya, the magic bee, can do anything. It, it created the universe, it did everything, and the magic bee was the one that created and gave us uh, consciousness. There's another one that's interesting that I now use. Uh, there's, a, there's a YouTuber, um, I think he's Dutch probably, called Known No More, K-W-O-N-O, more, no, no more. Uh, he did a wonderful series on uh, the presuppositionalist argument. So he attacked Cy Tim Bruggenkate's presuppositionalist. But you can use part of that as well for other things. No, no more. And he does it with stick men. And then he, he uses different arguments. And he, you know, the intelligibility of God, even the concept of God, he attacks just the concept on its own. And then he goes into each one of these sort of points. And he uses a yellow quantum whisperer. Now, we, we know what each of those words oh, means, yeah. but put no. together yellow quantum whisperer, and what does that mean? You know, it's, it's not into what properties has it got? How do we know what it does, etc. So that's his equivalent. But he actually brought up an interesting one. So his knockdown argument that he felt against Tim Bruggenkate was using the 10th dimension. And he sort of wonderfully explained how this 10th dimension encompasses everything, but it's not a conscious entity. <laughs> and this would be an argument against the... So go and watch that and, and see what you think. Because he explained each level of, the, of this 10th dimension and the fact that the 10th dimension enc encompasses everything that we could possibly imagine, think about, or that's ever existed. So that's almost like a God, but it's not conscious. And it sort of derives from quantum you know, mechanics. The, the, <laughs> they do have it's, brilliant. it's really, really informative. And he's got a bit of a Dutch accent, but he goes through these arguments. It's him and it's Cy and he's, he's responding and so forth. Um, he doesn't do debates. He doesn't do that. But he, he does a wonderful series on, on refuting it. So there's a lot of good information mm -hmm. out there on this presuppositionalist stuff. And, of course, oh. I got tangled up a little bit when I spoke to Imran in the sense that he brought up rationality because I was waiting for, you know, how – where do, how do we account for logic? And of course, he used the word rationality and threw me off a little bit. But it was the I same was, basic thing. I was nudging you. I thought, Rob, come on. You are so silly. You are so, so wonderfully logical. Use it. Yeah. And sort of as soon as, because he, he, he went at it from the naturalistic point of view. And I've got some understanding of the, the philosophical argument. So he went at it. How do you account for it? And of course, what I should have asked him is, what do you mean by account? And what do you mean by rationality? What is That's, it exactly? Yeah. What are those two things? This is what I was, didn't you hear me how I was screaming at the... At the <laughs> Obviously not at that stage. <laughs> um, because I recognized this from Hamza. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, I'd heard him because that's, I, I sort of spoke to him at one point. I went, hey, you're the guy that, that 
there's the, 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 the that had this conversation with this other uh, atheist about he was using pretty much the pro, the Saitan Brugincat approach, which I I was reasonably familiar with. But then he brought it onto rationality, uh, and I still it was kind of bullshit to me even then. But I just didn't have the sort of it, it wasn't formulated in my mind at that stage. Um, and he's made sort of loads of mistakes that I've watched in other videos as well. So, you know, um, hopefully we'll have another conversation at some point where we can. You know, I don't know, he's not the sharpest knife, he's not. No, no, and again, you know, for you, this is all old hat, you've watched all of them and that sort of stuff. It's a shame I, I couldn't have like a live, you know, have a live, you know, have you live on the call while I'm in Speaker's Corner, you know, have a like a live hangout. You know that you can actually do that. Um, okay. if, if you use Periscope or one of these these apps, uh, you mm. can actually do that. Oh, okay. I could I could try that, um, but then obviously it's somehow be in contact with you. We could do the live stream. I have thought about that. I just need to work out how you know because obviously there'll be a huge bandwidth that's going to be involved. So I just need no, to look at. No, it's not really. Contacts. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things where which allow you to do that, and it's even got a feedback circuit. So so if you have, um, I've, I've seen people do that uh, when they go. Uh, they, because there's a movement in the states now where they go and they record what cops what what public servants do in public oh okay and they use that technology because too many of them were arrested um on on bogus charges so what they do now is they have uh, their backup cameras um they have scanners police scanners so these people are then connected with them and they go and tell them okay now they've they've just alerted this you can expect three units coming from your left um so walk over there and then they, they prepare them for them and then you know then they guide them because they have the contents from the scanner and they can tell the other guys, the activists, what to do and where to go. Oh, and this is all being broadcast live on YouTube or yeah, something? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Interesting. I'll look into that to see, because obviously for people who are not in Speaker's Corner, you've now got to wait for videos to be uploaded. The other thing that happens, I often get into conversation with other atheists, and so obviously... I don't think most people want to see two atheists talking, so I don't often record those. Mm. Um, and it's obviously getting to have more conversations with some of the other people there, like Mansoor and Hasim and this one and that one and so on. You know, a uh, big, big Muhammad is the tall guy with a sort of beard. Oh, the uh, gay guy. <laughs> uh, is he? Oh. I, I think know. he's gay because oh, okay. he's always touching and clinging and, and embracing. Yes, yes, very touchy feeling guy. That yeah, yeah. It's like okay, but he's just stand there. That's fine. You don't have to be holding on to me. Maybe you're just super friendly or whatever the case is. <laughs> <laughs> just stand over there. You know, he, he definitely loves to touch and hold people by the shoulder and give exactly. them a long dawa session. I saw another one of him recently. Um, you know, so that's why I call him the, the gay guy. <laughs> but he's so hilarious. Um, by, by the way, let me, let me just ask you. Did you watch the video where I explained where the Quran says that God creates humans and jinn to worship him and yet the rejection is 80%? No, I haven't. If you pop that in the chat or send me a link, I'll, I'll def I'm looking through some of them. I'm on one of your channels. Um, I've used it recently somewhere. Uh, the show imam or whatever it is, I think it is. Okay, how effective do you think it is? Because it says that um, humans are created to worship this is the the purpose that they have okay They're, so humans are like toasters they have a purpose and the purpose is to worship god this is the reason why god creates humans to worship him okay now the, the way that it happens is he creates the first one it doesn't it's a sikh the second one is a hindu the third one is an atheist the fourth one is a jew or something only the fifth one is a muslim because only 20 percent of the population is muslim which means that the the failure ratio of this God, this creator, the best of the creators, the failure rate is 80%. Ah, okay. So what they would say is, no, 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 we're all born Muslim. So they get around that. But it's a bit like the presuppositionalist argument um, that goes, you know, we're, we're all born knowing God exists and we, we uh, either have forgotten or reject him. So Muslims okay, so all God didn't we're know all that? born. Say again? God didn't know that? No, he knows that we just don't know that we're Muslim. That's okay, but God created us knowing full well that we will be an atheist later. Hey, that part of it, I'm with you there. That makes so God no knows in advance that he's going to fail and then blames us for his failure. Yes, they, they attempt to rationalize. I have not heard a How effective good do you argument. think that is? Well, uh, exactly. Um, you know, if he's got foreknowledge and, you know, I, I always, you know, for me, it's, it's the illusion of, of will that we have. Not from our point of view. We think we've got free will. But if there's foreknowledge that is absolutely certain and that, that it's known exactly which path we're going to take, it's not that we're being forced. Whenever I bring this up in, in uh, Speaker's Corner, they attempt to get around it by going, hey, 
does knowledge mean force? Is he trying to, is he forcing you? I'm saying, no, you're using the wrong language. The fact that exactly. he knows what we're going to do means that it's an illusion from his point of view. Exactly. He's looking down going, ha, ah, you lot, it's an illusion for you. You think you've got free will, but you don't. We're going, hey, we've got free will because we don't know anything. We don't have that foreknowledge. So I think raising my hand is my own free will, which by the way, even without a God, I'm very skeptical that we have free will in the normal sense that people understand. Again, mm -hmm. the book by Sam Harris and a few other books, you know, with a deterministic view, view seems to show, and, and neuroscience seems to show that, that most things are deterministic. Compatibilism is the option that goes, hey, you know, even though most things are deterministic, there's still some freedom within us. But that's a whole separate topic. Um, but that, yeah. that whole view of, you know, God having foreknowledge, and then, you know, we are following along. And so all I'm claiming is that there's an illusion from God's point of view. He's looking down, and we don't have free will from a God point of view. We can claim free will down here, but it's a difference. So it's it's not the same as God giving us free will, for want of a better word. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, they, they try this the whole thing of going, no, well, knowledge doesn't mean force or anything like that. I'm going, that's fine. You can say those words. That's not the word you're using, like, how tall is the, is the color blue? You're using incorrect language there. And, and if, that makes, <laughs> if that makes you feel happy to go, oh, well, God's not forcing me. They don't seem it's to get so the point. It's funny to hear someone else use your own words. <laughs> Because I use the exact same argument. I do. Okay. It's like, yeah. <laughs> but now, yeah. if, if you, you've got your, your feet on the ground there and, and you can sense um, the, the, the sort of the desperation within these apologists, what do you think? Is, is there a difference in approach that you take between the people? Is, is, a, is a Hamza Tzorz is different to a Shabir? Uh, yes, because it depends on the response I'm getting. So once I get to know people, I kind of... Um, have got an idea of how they're going to respond and not necessarily the words they're going to use, but how, what sort of knowledge they have and at what level I, I as far as I can, I can engage with them. Uh, and so Shabir is in a, I think is in a category all by himself. Most other people that I speak to there attempt to give relatively straightforward answer, whether I agree with it or not is, is a different point of view. Um, but obviously Shabir's methodology is, is, Certainly, you know, if I'm charitable, very questionable. Uh, but nobody else does it to that level, certainly not consciously. They might do it unconsciously and go off on the point and tangents and stuff like that, um, but not consciously. So, yes, it, it, it is uh, a difference. I'm, with people that I know, um, I kind of gauge what, they're, what level they're at. And so, again, at some level, I'm paying either more attention or less or whatever the case is. Subconsciously, it's not like I'm going, okay, I'm not going to pay attention to you. But I just find myself paying more to the people that, that seem to be quote unquote a little bit more intelligent, but more knowledgeable, etc. Uh, and so when people bring silly arguments, then I kind of it's almost like you know it it seems easy, trivially easy to show them. But of course, I'm speaking to somebody, and it's like they've got a big filter in front of them, so they're not able to really hear what I'm saying anyway. So um, it, there are different approaches for different people. Sorts us, for example, if I got to speak to him, um, I would have respect for him because I know that he knows more than me. I don't. I don't believe that he's got the answers better than I do but he could certainly ask me questions to which I don't have the answers and then of course to you know his you know acolytes and followers it seems like oh he's got the better of me all that's happened is I haven't answered a question that there is in fact an answer for and again if I find an expert out there they could very well answer that question and probably to a point where you know the exact opposite happens so um, yeah there's definitely different I find myself subconsciously, you know, approaching it a bit differently, especially if the guys I know and some of them are quite okay in my, in my point of view. I have a conversation. Ali Dawa, you know, I know you've sort of really hammered on him, but from a from a from a if I put aside the beliefs, I could sit down and have a conversation with a guy because at some level I think he's a genuine person. Yes, he's confused about Islam, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but he's he's somebody that I could sit and have an honest conversation. He's done a few things where I've gone, you know what, that's an honest thing to do. Like, you know, they, they caught Godwin out. Godwin was trying to be a smart ass at one point. Godwin's a, a, one of the black Christian guys. He was trying to be a bit of a smart ass and claimed, oh, no, 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 this doesn't happen. And he was actually shown up by another Christian. And they all went, oh, and they all started to laugh and stuff. And he was the one guy that said, stop it, guys. We're not here to, to show him up. Just calm down, calm down. The man can accept when he's wrong. And of course, Godwin was in real time being shown that he was wrong. And it took him like five minutes to kind of Sem, sem, semi accept that he'd been shown up as being wrong because he was all bravado oh show me that it's x y and z and then of course he was shown so that's not a a, a, a view that i would ever take oh, oh you're all wrong let me show you i'm going to annihilate you even if i thought i could and um, that's just not my approach necessarily because it could be that you know 
somebody's got an answer that that shows me I'm, I'm wrong. So I, I, don't, I don't go in with that sort of uh, approach. It's more like, okay, let's have a conversation. Let me listen to what you're saying and see what whether it makes sense in my limited mm-hmm. understanding. The one guy that I would say as well that, that I'm – there's a few guys that I won't have a conversation with. They just – one of them is this Hassan guy that sort of stands on a, on a platform and he straw man's atheist like you can't believe. So he's a very dark-skinned guy. I had a conversation where he talked about incest, et cetera. And again, I could have dealt with that a bit better, but my point still stands. Unless you can demonstrate to me a net negative effect of, of incest, who am I to say it's wrong? Now, I, I don't agree with it. I don't accept it. I wouldn't. But how can I, how can I tell somebody else it's wrong if we're talking about consenting adults, for example, unless there's a net negative effect? Just because I don't like it is not a good enough reason. And just because a book says so is not good <laughs> yeah. enough reason, even I though I don't agree with it. Because I can say the same thing with, with you know, Islam. Um, yeah. I don't like it. Nobody should have it. You know, so we've got, we've got to be consistent here. So, you know, ha, 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 you know, you, you, co- and it was like a schoolboy conversation. Uh, it was like we're in a, in a playground. Uh, and actually I got a bit frustrated with that because he didn't answer my question. I put up the entire video of where I asked him about the universe, etc. And his, his go-to little argument is to get atheists to, you know, talk about incest. Uh, and some atheists kind of try and dance around the point and, and don't want to answer directly. And he ca- kept trying to press them. So that's his little go-to argument to show how immoral atheists are. And of but, course, my point do, still stands. Do you, do you know just, that Islam allows incest? Does it? Yeah. No, no, I wasn't aware of that. Apart from the Adam and Eve story, which some people have told me. No, 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 no. Okay. Do I have my incest video? Okay. Did, did you see the link I put there for the mistake in the Quran? Uh, bring it up. There we go. Got it. Yeah. So I'll uh, I'll bring that up. This I found on Daily Motion, I think. Yes, I've got it's, it. It's disappeared from... I'll have a look at that later on. Yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Um, so while you we look, just quickly go... Yeah, go ahead. I'll incest. carry on just chatting. Um, so he's one guy I won't have a conversation with, A, because he's straw man's atheist positions. He's not there for, for an honest conversation, he's trying to win. And plus, he's not intellectual in any sense. So he's like one of these school, like kind of like a schoolboy bully. But there are people like Mansur and other people that, that actually have got some knowledge. Whether we agree with them or not, I'm trying to look at, does this person, can I have a really somewhat decent conversation with them? And there are people that, that I can do. The other one that I'm less likely to want to have a conversation with now is Gary. Um, who's the black pantheist with the glasses that walks around with the iPad. Now, he's yeah, openly he's, racist. He's full of himself, and he, he makes Very mistakes much. left, right, and center. Uh, makes claims that he can't back up. He uses appeal to authority. If, if, they, if, if somebody said to me, oh, Rob, what's the appeal to authority? So go watch a couple of videos of, of, of Gary. He will give you appeal to authority. He will appeal to his professors and so forth, regardless of what they say. I don't care what their qualifications are. I want to know what they say. Exactly. It could be the man exactly. on the street. It could be, you know, you know the president of the United States. I don't care who they are. Um, I want to know what they say and we can evaluate their things. Um, but of course, he brought up that racist thing, which you might have seen uh, when he was speaking to Big Muhammad at one point, and I filmed part of it. Um, mm. And Sarah, unfortunately, is bought into that, which I'm going to challenge him on a little bit because I think Sarah is smarter than that. He's just got caught up in, and, I, and maybe I'm making excuses and I shouldn't be. Maybe he actually believes it and he's got good reasons. I haven't heard them, but he's got caught up in this whole Black Lives Matter and, and you know, blacks are, you know, oppressed and all this sort of stuff and white superiority and all the rest of it. Um, and I just think, you know, is he really, is he just bought into this? Does he really believe it? I, I'm not so sure. Gary, I think, is is completely taken with it. Gary's on a different level. Like, you, you couldn't say anything to Gary. He's like, closed off he's like a fundamentalist i, I would you know put it he that kind of keeps on telling people that blacks are superior to everything in every aspect of white yes yes yeah, yeah. Uh, and That's basically stupid. i looked that up it's called the melanin theory and it's completely discredited pseudoscience where a couple of people in the u.s have brought up this they brought up a theory that because melanin which is the dark pigment of skin um somehow infers you know um extra abilities on black people <laughs> They've got no basis whatsoever for this. You're pointing to a few people. It's all pseudoscience nonsense. Um, so I'm quite happy if he brings that up again to tell him you're just talking nonsense. Show me where it says this and I'll bring up, here's the counter to this. We're done with this. That's a done argument. There's a few things where I can go in quite confidently. That's another one. Don't bring up what, this. Right? What was quite funny was Shabir when he, when he came and you, you actually went to a particular book, I think it was, or, or you, you went to one person and then, then he said, yeah, 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 I know this. I've read the book. And, da, da, da. and then I thought, hang on, he, there's something fishy here. He, he doesn't sound that right. I mean, it, this is more than he normally does. And then I looked this up and he said, 
this is when he goes to this cabin and for the last 16 years then he does that and you said yeah yeah, yeah that's the one he what he does ah uh, yes waking up sam harris is waking up yeah, yeah exactly yes. and what happened what, i even looked at the book and i went to google books and you, you know you can read a couple of things you can read the introduction and then it, it blanks it out he read exactly that part because that is the only part that he quoted he didn't quote anything else out of the book only the part that was available in the beginning. So I think what Shabir does, he looks at these books, and, and because he also does this with um, um, Hawking, Stephen Hawking, and he goes and reads a couple of things, remembers the page numbers and what it says there, and that is it. He, I don't think he actually understands everything it says there. He just remembers and it makes him look knowledgeable and then people who are not 100% sure will leave him alone on it because they think, aha, he has read it, he knows what he's talking about. He does not. And I was hoping that you will then go deeper because you started going deeper, but he managed to divert you. And I was hoping that you would continue on this and say, well, remember what it says on the next page after that. Well, I didn't have the book at that stage. I had read the book, but I didn't have the book. And of course, very few people are going to know off the top of their head um, a page number or whatever. And that's why I questioned his assertion about Harris kind of backtracking about spirituality. Uh, I have actually got the book on here and I will reread it again. And, and he actually quoted page numbers between page 24 and 26 or whatever. Exactly. It is. I'm going to be a bit more charitable than you and say there's no evidence for me that, that he's only reading one or two pages. Um, it could be that he's read the entire book. Um, where I do agree with you is that quoting a couple of pages does make you sound very intellectual, like you you have read the whole book. Now, I'm not going to say he hasn't read the whole book, um, but what I would say potentially is that he's mischaracterizing what is being said there or Harris's view that he's backtracking and, and so forth. That's not my understanding, of, but I will read it again to be sure. The problem that, that happens, and this is a big thing in, in, in Speaker's Corner, and you've highlighted it to a point, people can make claims, assertions. It's yeah. much harder to refute. I can say anything. Yeah. Uh, and it's much harder to refute. Now you've got to go look on the internet. It's very time consuming. And especially something like that in a live conversation, you're not, you're not really, I've got the book now on my phone. So if that were to happen, if he quotes any of the Harris books, I've got them all and I can go to an exact page and we can read it together. Um, but you're never going to know that sort of stuff. And, and so it's, you can't really refute it on the spot other than like I kind of said, I went, mm, I don't think that's what he said. Cause I'm very familiar with Harris where he's not backtracking on anything in that sense. But again, he's quoting a page number, so it's, it's hard unless you've got the book in front of you. Okay, let's read this. And of course, it's three pages, so we could read it for the camera. Uh, but then it's easy for somebody to say, oh, well, do you know what? I got the page wrong. It was somewhere else. And, and so mm. you know, that, that's also true. Yeah. Yeah, it's but very this is easy my to get out of it. This is my, uh, okay, intuition. It's, it's, I, I cannot substantiate it. This is just what I saw. It, it was just, he was a little bit too cocky, more than he usually is. Um, <laughs> It could have been just coincidence that these are the pages that you could see and these were public. I don't know. But it's interesting. You know, this, this last conversation I had with him, there's been a lot of um, obviously comments um, about how I've completely misinterpreted the phone example. And you know what? I'm just a stupid guy and I can't follow Shabir. He's at an intellectual level that's different to me. Um, you know, this sort of thing. And um, I, I'm just fascinated that there's a, there's, there's a lens over people's views or whatever that they can you know see it to that point of view i'm quite happy if you can point out a mistake um but i don't think the in, the entire approach is is wrong from my point of view of wanting concise answers to questions before you go off on all kinds of tangents to quote give a greater understanding no, absolutely and, and his acolytes or his and followers he that. yeah his followers seem to suggest do you know what he's just giving a better understanding and you're just not bright enough to follow along there he wants to give you this big understanding it's um, the opposite you are keeping him on track well, that's that's my view anyway, um, as well. At least there's somebody else that agrees with me. You um, should nail him down on one topic and say, okay, let's go to the bottom of it. Let's see how much you really understand about this. I mean, because I he's the one who's always saying, yeah, I know this, I know this, I know this. He does not. Yeah, you know, and I did, I did uh, attempt to pin him down on certain things. And whenever he brings up an analogy, um, you know, it's a red flag for me. It, it just goes off on a tangent that doesn't really. Exactly. And of course, but again, all his followers, do you know what that, that analogy was spot on? He's shown you, Rob, you know, he's schooled you, he's owned you. You know, you just couldn't follow it. Uh, and I'm going, oh, you, you either dishonest or you just intellectually challenged or whatever the case is. And maybe both of the, well, I don't think I'm dishonest because I know myself. So that's just a, a spurious claim. I could be that I'm intellectually challenged. Uh, and when I'm listening there from my point of view, 
I'm listening clearly to the, and I'm actually putting God and everything else, and I'm listening as closely as I can with, you know, my limited intellect, granted, to the analogy that's been given. Uh, but what I do notice is whenever anal analogies are brought up, there's a lot of parameters missing. There's a very good video that I was thinking about doing a critique on. If you go and look back at uh, All Truth Revealed, you will find a video where he speaks to a guy called Philip. Uh, initially, there's two parts of the video. The first part is um, Shabir Yusuf speaks to a a a arrogant atheist, and it starts with Isaac, uh, Isaac, the, the black atheist that's kind of speaks a couple of times to Abbas, the sort of East London guy that's kind of amusing. Um, that just talks about how they believe in flying horses and donkeys and all that sort of stuff. You know, he's not an intellectual guy. He's just there for a bit of amusement. But then he speaks to this white guy, Philip, um, who did have some intellectual knowledge, talked about the law of parsimony. And I felt Shabir was completely out of his depth there. He didn't understand what law of parsimony was, et cetera. And, and the whole, that whole seven minute conversation um, was fascinating to listen to how he interrupted him, et cetera. And then there was another 35 minute conversation with the same guy where again, should be a brought up kind of an analogy and i just listened to this guy and i went wow this guy knows a fair amount he was but he was very quiet so it was he was very easily overwhelmed okay. he wasn't he wasn't at the same sort of level but go look that up it's arrogant atheist and then you sort of fast forward a bit and he starts to speak to this short sort of sh shorter white guy with glasses called philip and there's a second part of that uh, and if you just listen so, to philip even if you forget are and arrogant arrogant atheist but it is on the all truth revealed um channel so it'll be arrogant uh, atheists get schooled by muslim hyde park all truth revealed about 2014 i think if i remember correctly uh two years ago 25 yeah. minutes Yes, yes. So if you scroll through, because then the camera moves away because Isaac is, is shouting very loudly and so forth. And so, so Shabir moves away and, the, and this young white guy moves away. And so, a couple of parts, are, and I was actually going through this like sentence by sentence because I was really fascinated with this particular one because it was much shorter as well. Um, so it might be that you do a little review on that, you know, because um, I, I just get a lot of thumbs down, et cetera, on these sort of reviews. So um, I'm not sure how oh, useful it is. Um, it could be useful. I mean, I the first... Uh, critique I did, I actually had a couple of people in Hyde Park who had watched that come up and shake my hand quietly. And I was like, wow, really? Because obviously there was a huge amount of negativity how I'm not giving him a chance to respond, how I should have said this live, etc. And I obviously pointed out that, you know, um, it's very useful to go back over it and, and, and I critique myself. I said, hey, here's what I did wrong. Here's what I could have done better. Here's why I felt where we went off track. Here's the crazy example he gave, etc. Yeah. etc. Um, so uh, but that one will be interesting for you, that last sort of 10 minutes or whatever it is sort of thing. If you listen closely, there's a bit of time where you can't hear a few things. But if you listen to Philip, he's, he's quite quiet, unfortunately. Had he been a bit more forceful, I think the conversation could have been better. Um, but he sort of got a little bit overwhelmed uh, to a degree, bullied a little bit. Uh, that's maybe not fair, the word bullied. But Shabir spoke over him a lot. Uh, and I think Shabir also is able to understand the person he's speaking to and then he can he can change text to a degree you know if he's got somebody who's quite uh, in his face like sarah then it's a different approach and you'll see with philip there he's he's, he's you know quite over him and kind of cuts him off without him allowing him to when we investigate the subject matter oh my god i get so sick when i hear him and there's you know there's a lot of those general generalities in there that that, that really aren't helpful um, so again, you know, I'm going to continue with my way. I want to understand what people believe and why they okay. believe it. Give me concise answers, then we can evaluate your answers. Exactly. Give me a long story where we forget what the original yeah. question was. That isn't helpful, particularly, and that's what I wanted to nail down originally with Shabir, is if we both believe in truth or, quote, to use his term, a greater understanding, and we go off on a tangent and I say, hey, we're not getting a greater understanding here. If we both agree that that's what we want, would you consider re-evaluating the way you give me an answer because if you want me to be in a conversation and you're charitable and you want me to understand your best argument or your best response then give it to me in a way that i can understand don't give me a long story that you're so used to because that's the way your machinery runs uh, because that's not helpful to me unless you want to attempt to confuse me or to throw the conversation off fine but if you want to have an honest dialogue then i'm going to ask you to repeat yourself or give it to me in a different way that's what i would do but hey i don't want to force my position on anybody else quote unquote yeah. But I would I would still ask that okay, I, I always say there's there's different approaches, okay, depending on the person, and which is why I thought it was quite interesting that you said that there are really um fundamental differences between the guys. Um so, so I I would then choose which approach to use, whether you're gonna go for the Quran, whether you're gonna go for the contents, or whether you're gonna go for the um for the belief thing. 
So, See, I'm not that, as I say, I'm not that, unfortunately, at this stage anyway, I'm not that clued up on the Quran, except for certain claims. So, you know, when they make these scientific claims, these are, you know, Okay, hit me. Just, just ask. I mean, just, just from the top of your head. Mm. Which one? Sorry? Okay, so the, a couple of the ones they make. One is, one is this whole thing, and, and I did have a conversation with Shabir, and I was, again, very generous. They're far too generous. Um, so the um, heavens and the earth were split asunder, and this they reinterpret as to match the inflationary model of cosmology. Okay. When was earth formed? Wasn't that 10 billion years after the Big Bang? Yeah, pretty much. Well, the earth okay, is, so God six, is wrong by 10 billion years. And they, they don't they don't have a problem with 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 um, the age of the universe or the age of the earth. No, 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 no. no. Oh, okay. Earth was formed four billion years ago. Mm -hmm. Earth was not formed at the Big Bang. Correct. That's part. So there's, there's a 10 billion year gap between the Big Bang and the formation of the Earth. But again, if you listen to the uh, the response that Shabir gave me, the, he used the reductionist argument, which again, I didn't catch well enough um, in the sense that he went, oh, well, what's the Earth made of? You know, these sort of, ooh, seems like an intelligent, normal question. Well, obviously it's atoms. What's the universe made of? Atoms. So, oh, well, they were all made of atoms. So now we can we can roll it all the way back to the Big Bang. What do we have? Atoms. No, that's, yeah, but see, this is exactly the bullshit. Where does the gold and the earth come from? Was that created? You see, the thing is, it's exactly what you say. It's the reductionist approach. All matter, all atoms, all everything, all elements were created at the Big Bang. Yeah, and you see what I could have said there and should have, you know, and I'm learning as I go along. And that's why I say I'm no expert. Uh, what I should have said is, oh, well, that's fine, should be. But then by that same, by your quote, same logic, in adverted commas, Adam was created at the Big Bang. Because right. clay, which is, if we do your reductionist argument, is atoms. Yeah. And everything else is atoms. So then the Quran must be wrong about Adam because Adam was actually created during the Big Bang. If you want to use the argument that, that the earth and the heavens were created at the Big Bang because they were all particles, then you've got to accept the same for every other you know, facet of creation. You can't the then thing, do special. The next thing is, if you go look at the formation of Earth, how how do you account for the word heaven or adamant, the the, the heaven, the, the the plural? Well, my understanding now, obviously, having looked into it, there were seven heavens, and that was kind of the common view at that stage. So you had these seven levels of heaven and the Earth, and they were split asunder. In other words, the Earth was split away from the heavens. That's my understanding. That's apparently what is heaven. Correct me. Say again. What is heavens? I guess the, if I have to just answer off the top of my head, it's it's the separation, let's say, above the stratosphere of the earth. Exactly. This is uh, where you need to catch it. Define heavens. Tell me what it is. Aha. Uh -huh. Is it used like that throughout the Quran, or is this just you making this up now? I think he kind of answered that to some degree. I'd have to look at the video again by going, well, the heavens is space. So he equated the heavens with space. Or exactly. So is universe. space always equal to heaven? No. Yes, um, well, obviously I agree with that now, but of course he, he wanted to equate the two, and yes, they are the same. Um, this, is, this is why if you have seven heavens, what are the seven heavens? If this is space, you can't have seven spaces. Well, they, uh, and I've heard that, and they go, oh, well, can you prove there's not seven heavens? And so no, logically we can't prove what's outside of the universe. So if you're, if you're claiming there's another six heavens outside of the universe, or how many heavens are you claiming that we don't know about? No, I can't prove a negative, but why, why are you making assertions? You know, I can just, I can just well assert there's no other heavens. How, how do we know? You know, so, you know, so that argument I don't think has got any validity whatsoever to go, oh, well, this, this only refers to the first heaven, and there's another six that you don't know about. How can you prove they aren't there? Well, how can you prove they are? Why are you making an assertion like that? That doesn't stand. So, but that's what I've heard as a particular argument. Okay. And then the logical part comes in. Why would a God, which is creating everything in a fine tuned version, <clears throat> put something together, which needs at a later stage to be pulled apart again? Well, no, they're equating or Shabir's argument when I brought this up is they are reinterpreting the splitting asunder of the heavens and earth to mean that at one point it was all together and it expanded like the cosmos, which for me is is utter nonsense. That you, you'd have to be a, the you know contortionist of all time to accept that that verse you know relates to the cosmology to the inflationary model of the universe. But oh, that's is this what, like, that's like one of these sponge T-shirts which you put into water and suddenly it gets into a T-shirt? Correct. That's, they are trying to reinterpret that the splitting asunder of the heavens and earth, or he is, I won't say all Muslims, because there are actually a few Muslims who reject all this science in the Quran stuff. Yeah. As you pointed out in one of your videos beautifully, 
that Maurice uh, Boussel was, was the guy that brought this. He's done more harm to Islam in this sort of point of view because most people still sort of claim, you know, scientific miracles. And obviously, even Hamza Tortz has tried to go that route with embry embryology and probably other, other things as well. It's done more harm if I had to look at it objectively than it's done any good because these are easily refutable things that experts in every field can go in and, and demonstrate is not the case. So it's much better if they use this allegorically than try to assert that this is actually yeah. scientific. And, and Sorts has actually retracted. He, he wrote a long article saying, no, we, we need to reevaluate that. Get, let's get rid of all of that. There is no embryology. It's about creation. It's about a God. And I said to him, you can't do that. If it's about a God, why would he use um, this, this roundabout method if he can just sort of somehow just, just create it? So it's, it's not about embryology. It is creation because you need to put the clay in there somewhere. And embryology does have, doesn't have any clay. And then he said, okay, it's true. And I said, all the other things are all down the drain. Forget about them. And that's when he went back and said, okay, there's nothing about science in the Quran. I've said that to a few Muslims as well. You, you can't have it both ways. Because again, one of the claims was, um, you know, the vastness of space. Um, not the vast. That was the old English translation. And, and around 1929, as you might know, or even before that, after Edwin Hubble, you know, you know, demonstrated along with, it wasn't, he wasn't the only person, by the way, he, yeah. he, he um, discovered that galaxies were moving away. What, I don't even know if he discovered that, but between him and a, and a couple of other people, according to Krauss's book, there was a discovery that obviously that light was, there was the different um, wavelengths of light and that galaxies were moving away at faster than light speed. It's the book um, of the redshift. The red, correct. Uh, and after that, there was at least, I've got at least one translation that talks about the expansion or the expanding Expansion or expansion. Yeah. So the so the translations changed, and I pulled them up about this in the speaker's corner. And of course, the response was, "Oh well, all we're doing is is um, the the word has got multiple meanings, and of course, all we're doing is updating with the latest um, scientific data." Okay, the, the word like, is la musiuna, and this is a verb. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, <laughs> if if you say, and you can go to Corpus Quranus, which which gives you the word by word, and it tells you what, what it is from a grammatical point of view, and blah blah blah, and it gives you all the details. So, if it is a verb, how how did he how did you do this? If if it is expanding, he 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 is still expanding. No, what was it? If he created the heavens with great might, and he is the one. And he created it. Ah, no, it was not a verb. Sorry. With the dahaha, it was a verb. This is the opposite. This is an, um, a, 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 a different, I can't remember the construct, but it was not a verb. So it couldn't have been he is expanding it, but he is creating it expansive. So all expansive they changed is, the is expansive into expanding. And most of my translations that I've got about six here, um, most of them say vastness or vast space or, or words yeah. to that effect. So, but when I looked up this whole thing of how did it suddenly change to expansion and that or expansive or whatever, that particular word or, or similar sounding word only came in around about the 19, you know, Correct. late 1920s. So they updated the English translation to match the science. Uh, and they and have an the additional problem because they translated is that constantly. And then in 96, when they found out that it's actually accelerating, they had to change it again because then they had to take up the constantly because it was not ex expanding at a constant rate <laughs> because it was accelerating. But in some translations, they forgot about it. So you still get translations which have this word continuously or constantly or something like that. Yes, you know, so so the whole science in the Quran, I think, is easily refutable. Yes. And as I say, you know, even, even though I'm you know, I'm critical of Islam. If I were to give them some advice, stop using this, just bury yeah. this, throw this away. This is a done deal in any sense. Whenever you try and bring this up, it either me either tells me that you haven't really, you just, you know, running some talking points that you've heard, but you haven't really dealt into, you know, the criticisms, etc., which are seemingly easily refuted. So just don't bring up, you know, I'm fine if you want to say it's allegorical and it tells part of a story and it's in a wider context yeah. of some other yeah, message. Yeah. Absolutely fine, but don't quite try and claim that. Or if you are going to claim that the translations are being updated by science, then you can't, on the same hand, on the on the other hand, claim that it's a scientific miracle. You got to choose one or the other. Ideally, just just go and say, hey, it's all allegorical, and we're updating it so that it's more um, easily understood by people. If I'm giving some advice to Muslims out there, they'd rather do it that way. But don't go and claim that it's actual scientific, you know, 
miracles in the Quran because that's just, you know, from a skeptic's point of view, you're just making yourself look silly with that. That's schoolboy type of things that isn't necessary. Um, so I don't think he's, he's helped Muslims in any sense. They must have jumped on it at the time and gone, wow. And it's still kind of being fed out there. And I still hear it at, at Speaker's Corner, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a series now. Um, I'm, I need to do the alcohol video and then I'm going to do something, a series called Islam Info. Um, then I will be, these are going to be very quick things, just, just, you know, matching the attention span of today's audience and just one item at a time. And then I'm going to do exactly this. This is the claim. This is reality. No, because I developed this, this three T truth test. Um, is, is it in the Quran? Is it really in reality? And, and I can't even remember the third one. Is it real? Oh no. Is it a miracle? Is it real? And is it, um, something that people could have known? Um, those are the three things that I always uh, used to test with these things. And then oh, yeah. this, this was the first thrust. Then the second one is what, what I said, what Thousand and One Inventions is doing, that they suddenly come and say, everything that was ever invented or discovered was due to Islam. And this is what led to the, um, well, to the whole wisdom and, and the Renaissance and, and all the universities and hospitals. This is all because of Islam and this all happened a thousand years ago. This is the second claim that is, is coming through. Yes, again, you know, um, you know more than me, but that seems utterly spurious to me um, in any sense from my understanding. Um, so, you know, these are things that aren't necessary anyway. Uh, and, and it, you know, for those of us who are skeptical, just looking at this going, you're not, you're not doing yourself any favors. You, you're, you're in yeah, fact, for those exactly. honest Muslims out there who really follow the Quran and who use it allegorically and who want to fit in with Western society, these thousand and one inventions these other people are not doing you guys any favors no, it's a so what and i and i've got some Muslim, there could be a few there's a few of the people there that one of them was was a nice guy gave me the quran i could sit down and have dinner with a guy i could you know that sort of thing he was he's much more you know sort of mild in that sense uh and that's the thing i know a number of muslims and the less fundamentally they follow the the, the quran the nicer the people they are as people um and so obviously the guys in Qatar, the guys in, in Emirates, I mean, who do you think I went out with in the evenings? Of course, with the people. Mm. And, and I mean, my wife wasn't there all the time. She came out and, and when she realized it was not, um, not dangerous or something, and then we had a, a whale of a time. Um, but the rest of the time I went out with the guys. So of course you, you meet up with Muslims and you go out with them and then you make friends with them. And there's no problem whatsoever. They're most hospitable. They're, they're very easygoing. They're totally relaxed. They don't care. Okay, not in Saudi, okay, but, but I'm, I'm talking now in, um, in Qatar or Emirates. You say not Saudi, then. Obviously, you, you've probably been there, so you've got a lot of experience. I had a Saudi young guy come to Speaker's Corner, and he sort of gave me an eye open. He goes, you know what, Rob? Um, there are a lot of young people now who are questioning a lot of things. There's a lot yes. of people out there who are not following yes. you know, the strict thing. And I was like, wow, that, that yeah. gives me some hope for humanity, and particularly in Saudi Absolutely. Arabia, which is obviously... You know, one of the, the sort of worst places one can be if you if you want to speak out against Islam in any way. Yeah. Well, come on. An atheist is being considered as a terrorist because it's political. So you're a traitor. Yes. Yes. So it's exactly. treason. And, and this is people don't understand. They always say it's a religion. We love Jesus. Well, no, <laughs> you don't. Number one, it's a different Jesus. It's it's, it's the Jesus who, who lived a thousand years before the Jesus in Christianity because Maria is the sister of Aaron and Moses. So there's a, there's a you know, difference of a thousand years there. So, you know, it's a totally different Jesus. And that's the other thing that people seem to do. They use the two quo quo fallacy occasionally, which is, oh, well, if Islam's bad, look how bad Christianity is. And oh, I'm, I'm quite yeah. happy to admit that, and, well, not that I care one way or the other, but I'm quite happy to admit that there's a lot of barbarity, et cetera, in the, in the Old Testament and even some in the New, et cetera. What we don't see in modern, the modern world is a great deal of, of people basing their claims and doing violent things based on those old things. They've kind of moved on. And, and the few that are, they stick out like, you know, sore thumbs, like um, that Baptist group, that, that sort of, you know, fundamentalist group in the U.S. that goes out, hate fags, all that sort of stuff. Right. You know, they follow the fundamentals very closely, uh, according to them, uh, and they just stick out like, you know, complete nutters. Um, so there is a difference. Yes, Christianity was bad. It's gone through its renaissance, and that hasn't happened yet, uh, particularly in, in the Middle East. Uh, but even in other countries, I get reports and see things from supposedly moderate countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, where Sharia has been implemented, even if not at a high government level to the same level as, as Saudi Arabia, at lower levels in districts, et cetera, where 
you know, and shocking things are happening. Yeah, I've been to, I was in Kale and I was quite surprised that on the one hand, they are totally secular and they, they totally reject Islam. And then on the other hand, you have the fundamentalists. Now, if you're going a little bit to the east in, in, in Malaysia, then you find that they are more uh, Quran centric, whereas in, in, in the capital, you don't find this at all. Mm. The same thing in Singapore. It, I mean, it's only 300 kilometers away. So what the funny story is, you don't see any kind of Islamism when you are in the streets, when you're outside, if you're in the offices, there's nothing at all. It's not even in Qatar, we had an elevator only for the women. In Qatar, we had a floor only for the women. So, you know, there was a lot of things which you didn't get in Singapore. And yet now I had this in the news and gin tonic show that a lot of women, like we're talking 90%, are genitalia, have the mutilated genitalia. Women That's in special. Singapore. Really? Wow. And this was an eye opener for me because this is something that obviously I, I don't touch women when I am there. I mean, you're tempted and blah, blah, blah. But I did this when I was a kid. I did this when I was young. Yeah, sure. Uh, but nowadays I don't go and uh, mess around with uh, Muslim women. And so in Singapore, I never realized that most of the women there are mutilated, are cut. Absolutely shocking that. Uh, it was so, that was such a shock for me because I used to like Singapore. And then along comes Amos Yi, who's being stuck in prison for simply just saying something about um, Islam and Christianity. And they put him in jail for that. And it's crazy. It's, it's slowly happening, unfortunately, here as well. Um, you know, the, the, the fear of offending people instead of, you know, critically evaluating an ideology. You know, unfortunately, this is where the cognitive ability of, of people in power here is, is vastly, you know, it's split. On one hand, they, they're very... Um, focused on certain things like, you know, bringing, you know, the immigrants in and other things, which to some degree one can accept and others not. I mean, it happened here recently where they brought in all these kids. These kids were not kids. If you look at the pictures, there's no ways these were kids. They were all males. I didn't see a single female. Apparently there was one out of these 15. This was only 15 that were brought in. And of course, it was a big media thing in this country. Um, but the, the politicians and the people in power here just have cognitive dissidence, you know, where, where this sort of stuff is involved. Yeah. yeah, this is this is terrible because I mean, come on, Muslims go apeshit if, if there's a there's a, a caricature of Muhammad or something, but you should see the caricatures of the people of, of Western politicians and that in Arab speaking newspapers, they are not shy. And the funny thing is, if I go to like Oman, for example, I am asked everywhere constantly, it does even in Dubai, they have signs please respect the local culture dress according to the local culture you see this everywhere you have signs with something like 25 prohibitions if you go to the beach or any park or something and yet the same people who say respect the local culture expect me to respect their culture when they're in my country yeah there's definitely a double standard in the west um, right. and, and, and i'm people, totally okay with people coming in here having their own cultures but don't sure. expect me to respect that and there's certain things that are in, the moment something comes in conflict with the values of this country let's use an example then you either conform to this or you find somewhere else it's very simple but exactly. to say those words you're racist you're islamophobic etc cetera, etc cetera. the problem is with with democracy it's a double-edged sword yes we want to be you know open and, and fair with everybody the problem is what happens when you when you have people who don't want to, who are you being tolerant of intolerant people? And exactly. the more that this happens, is, this is the, the bigger the, the amounts come in, be. the yeah. worse it gets. Uh, and so and, you know, and this so, is why I have radicalized myself because I am no longer tolerant towards intolerance. Yeah, and I have to agree with you on that. I'm you know I would speak out. I'm not necessarily conservative or ultra right wing or anything like that. I believe in almost absolute freedom of speech. By the way, I'm probably more, I don't know about yourself, uh, I don't know if it was yourself or somebody else I heard recently going, okay, there are some limits to freedom of speech and I'm more on the on the side of there's almost no limits. Um, no, almost I, no I limits. I am saying words cannot insult, words cannot hurt, they're only words. There, there is a limit, um, freedom of expression, there is a list of eight things where you are sh where you shouldn't use it. Um, one of them was, um, as, no, the general gist is, as soon as it starts harming people physically, in other words, shouting fire in, in, in the cinema. Good that question. Is, mm. That is not freedom of expression. Okay, so let's explore that very quickly because um, I agree with you where there's a direct incitement to violence, 
that is my that's the limit that I have. That's yeah. the boundary line. Where so when Same somebody says, go out and kill X, go out and do this, and yes. there's clear incitement to it. I agree with that. Um, I don't agree with the fire in, in the crowded theater. I think that there's a very poor example. Hitchin pointed, Hitchens pointed that out as well. I don't think that should be um, banned because um, you are automatically assuming that there's going to be some negative effect. It could be that somebody shouts uh, fire in a crowded theater and everybody looks around and laughs and thinks this is a fool. So for me, I think that's a very poor example. Oh, okay. I've been challenged on this actually in Speaker's Corner by other atheists, etc. So I'm me personally, I'm on the side more of freedom of speech. So we'd have to have a, for me, there'd need to be better examples. And, and you probably have some, and I, I probably could agree with you. For me, I'm a fire in a crowd of theaters should not be banned at all. This hate speech okay, or this. You this, just showed me that I was wrong. Yes. Well, I'm not sure if, if I am. You, you could have a good example of it. Um, I, for no, no, me, but it's a bad I, I example. So. Exactly. And this fire, actually, you've just shown me that it's stupid to automatically assume that that is bad. Yes. No, because that was Justice Wendell Holmes back in the US in 1960-odd, and, and Hitchens criticized it, and I looked into it, and I went, well, you're absolutely right. But I, I, that's where I, you know, as an example, I'm very much liberal. Um, the other thing where I'm not, for example, is I, I don't want illegal immigrants coming in here, or anywhere for that matter. And, and, and the emphasis is on illegal. Uh, if you follow the, the channels and you're accepted for whatever reason, if you're a refugee, that's fine. If you've gone through the channels, we know where you come from, who you are, what, what you want to do, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the, those things are. No problem. But when they come across the borders here, you know, fortunately, they haven't as many over here, but they've come across in, in droves in Europe and not all of them. Again, not all of them. But there's a, enough of a small minority that's causing untold tensions in Sweden and Denmark and particularly in Germany and elsewhere that this is a major problem. And nobody wants to talk about it because then you're seen as racist, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. which is, of course, just labels to throw out there, to throw some shit at people because they haven't got a good argument. We see okay. things happening. Agreed. But, with people that have antithetical ideas that treat women and children like they would back in their country, and that's not what we have here. And nobody's strong enough to go, hey, like they have occasionally, even in Australia now, they're getting, they're getting it's a battle there now. They used to be very strong about it in Australia. You come here, you follow these rules, or you, you ship out. And that's, I think that's the yeah, message that needs to go out there. You know, we're very tolerant, we're very liberal. You follow our rules here. So, for example, I'm okay with women wearing hijab, burqa, whatever, but there's certain places like government buildings, like the airport, like other places where that should and must be banned. And if you want to go in there, you lift your veil. End of story. We need to see your face. It's a security risk. There is no respecting religions. If you don't want to go in there, then send your husband, send somebody else in there. But if you're going to be in this country, there's certain times where you need to follow our rules, not we amend our rules because it might offend you. Okay, there I disagree. Okay. In what way? I don't think a burqa should be allowed, full stop. Oh, you don't think it should be allowed at no, all? No, number one, is not, okay. the, the thing is always it's religious. No, it's not. It's not mentioned in the Quran. There is no necessity to wear any any kind of cover for of, of hair or, or breast or, or whatever. Um, I thought there was. When I when I actually asked uh, one of the one of the preachers there, he pointed me to a verse. I don't know if it was Surah 22, 24, somewhere in that vicinity that talked about it being uh, covered. Muhammad said cover up until X, Y, and Z part. It didn't talk about covering your face, but it talked about covering body parts. Yes. What, what was that about? It's supposed to cover the boobs. Oh, is that it? Okay. So there's no, there's no, is there something in the Hadith that, that talks yes. about them? Okay. So it's, it's more Hadith than it is Quran. Yeah. In the Quran, the thing is that you have the so-called aura and, and this aura is your private parts. Those should be covered. Um, okay, cool. But it doesn't say anywhere in the Quran that never once mentions the word hair or something like this. Does it say it in the Hadith or not? In the Hadith, yes. It does, okay. So, but are those authentic Hadith? So are they justified there or not? They, okay, <laughs> they differ. The one oh, which okay. says you should cover yourself is um, authentic. The one which says you should cover everything excepting your hands and your, um, your face is not. Okay, so there I guess I'd slightly disagree with you in the sense, and it sounds strange for me defending Islam. Do you not think that, that people should be entitled to wear what they want either no. in public or in their homes, if it doesn't affect no, them. At home, absolutely. If you are in a mosque, absolutely. Do what, whatever blows your hair back. But <laughs> I think that if you are in public, the human being is geared towards uh, recognizing faces. The, the, the human mind is, is so much um, fine-tuned for the recognition of facial expressions. We need the face. Now, okay, so uh, for me, it's, it's always been extremely weird. If I'm sitting in an office, I'm sitting in a meeting, and I've got two ladies there who are completely covered. You just hear a voice, but you don't know which one of the two is speaking. 
you don't know what what she's saying you don't know if underneath that bell she's she's smiling or she's she's serious is she making a joke is, is she now totally whatever you do not know and it's weird okay so i'm a i'm a i guess i'm slightly on the islamic side i'm or maybe undecided in the following sense from what you said there if i was kind of a um impartial judge i'm going does what you said there outweigh their right to wear that if they want to as i said there's certain places where outright they they cannot and shouldn't do it be it public buildings or other places where we need identification i guess the question to ponder is um does what you're saying outweigh outweigh their right to wear that if they choose not because they're being forced to do it but if they go hey do you know what that's what i want to do for and we can you know we can point out that maybe their their programming or their brain and their and their reasons for it are not good but if they quote unquote freely choose it or what you're saying does that outweigh their right to wear that i guess is the question i okay there's, put there's two there. things number one if i go if, if my wife goes to oman and she wants to go topless on the beach she's not allowed to She's been asked to dress the same way as the local culture does. The local culture in the UK does not see a burqa as the standard attire. So, no, it's, it's a matter of tolerance. It's a matter of how you tolerate um, local culture. The, the, the second thing is, what was, I lost the second thing. Yeah, yeah. Um... I lost the second thing. Okay. As we talk now, you might come up with it. Yeah. Okay, so no, but I need to. I mean, I need to get up like in six hours. Okay, no problem, no problem. I think we've had a great chat, so I appreciate the time. Thanks, stops. Um, I guess you're going to be on on uh, Sunday anyway, so yeah, I might, I might get back a bit later. Is it seven p.m. UK time? Because we haven't swapped the clocks over here. Yes. Yet. Okay, um, so I might might be late for that, but I'll pop in hopefully and and um, get there because depends what time i finish if there's nothing much going on or it gets dark and quiet then i'll probably leave early um Brilliant. yeah but um no i appreciate it so what i'll do is i'll save this and then i'll send you a link um man it's been brilliant thank you so much it's been a fascinating chat hopefully we can do it again in the future i'll come on yeah, and, because uh, I, I love exchanging things because you always learn things and i love to see other people's opinions and approaches because it's, it's absolutely it's the same for me i stand i can stand corrected on on anything really if, if there's a good argument i'll go away and think about it and you know, i'll come back I'll, I'll research to see what other views there are on a particular topic yeah. uh, if it's important one if it's something that's less important that's the other thing by the way it depends on the nature of the claim i'm much more likely to accept you know a lower level claim than i am a higher level claim for want of a better word or a more extraordinary claim so um it's been so absolutely anything brilliant. on philosophy i'll come to you in future well, i'm just not even a student <laughs> but i am interested so i'll go and look up things so if you bring something of interest i'll go look it up because i want to know a bit more about it as well to a point you know i'm probably not going to get high level with it but to a point where i can engage it at a, at a better level for me okay brilliant brilliant stops thanks so much take care and uh again chat to you on sunday see you next time then cheers then cheers bye